Welcome. My name is Teresa Schmidt, and it's a pleasure to present to you one of my favorite topics, integrated neuromuscular re-education. It's become one of my favorites because I've seen fabulous functional outcomes when including these techniques in my practice. And hopefully you too will be equally excited when you see the results you generate. Great thing about it, the, object the objective results we get are very measurable and very easy to document, which makes it nice and easy for billing purposes as well. So we'll go over a little bit about documentation, how you can see a change immediately with many of these techniques, and then how you can see changes in not only pain, which is pretty immediate, about 90 seconds time, but you can see changes in strength, range of motion, and functional ability. Most of today's techniques are highly adaptable to different positions. Many of the same techniques can be done in supine, prone, sitting in a wheelchair, very adaptable for home, school, or clinic, so easy to work with. This morning's topic is going to be positional release therapy, and positional release therapy is also called strain counter strain. That's a technique developed by Dr. Lawrence Jones in which we look for trigger points or tender points in the body, and then we use different positions to erase or modify those tender points or trigger points. So it really does make a nice difference immediately in the sensitivity of the muscle and in the muscle tone. Now, I've been using these techniques. I've been a physical therapist for 23 years. I'm board certified in orthopedic physical therapy. So the bulk of my practice is outpatient, although I've worked in most types of physical therapy places, whether it's schools, clinics, or hospitals. And you can modify and adapt most of these techniques across the lifespan, regardless of what type of site you're working in. They could be done on a table. They can be done on a floor. You know, oftentimes you're working in a school, you're on a mat, maybe in the gym. So very easy to modify and adapt the techniques. You need to know that there's a little bit of a neurophysiology background to everything we do today. Understanding the concept of why these techniques work will allow you to then start to create some of your own techniques for the future. By the end of this morning, you should have a good concept of how does positional release work, what are the muscle actions, and then how can we actually reproduce those to get a great release of trigger points and tender points in the body. And let's start a little bit with the introduction of neurophysiology. We're all movement practitioners, right? Okay, so we all work with muscle. At some point in time, we've gone through the torture of memorizing over 400 muscles in the body, right? Origins, insertions, innervations, actions. So it's important to remember those. And who remembers exactly where the omohyoid is anyhow, right? <laughs> or what it does. But that's okay. I will refresh you as we go through the day with the demonstrations. What are the muscles we're working on? What are their actions, their attachments? Because knowing exactly what the muscles do helps you be precise in doing everything we're covering today with a patient. And it helps you be quick, right? Sometimes with mismanaged care these days, we have very abbreviated treatment times. You might see someone six or eight visits, and their insurance cuts them off. So we need to give them as much good intervention as possible and then move forward from there. Get them into some functional home exercise programs, things that help them get back into their work, their recreational activities, back to the life they love. So that's what we're really looking for here. We all treat muscles. People come to us, they make appointments because they have problems with their muscle length. Muscles are too short, they're stiff. Muscles are weak, they're having trouble getting out of their chair, trouble walking, getting up and down stairs. So these create functional problems. We're going to address the muscle length problems by looking at the neuromuscular reflexes. I like to tell my patients, you have built into your body a security system. It's an automatic system that protects you from tearing up your muscles most of the time. But when there's a problem with those reflexes, maybe someone's been subjected to a disease, abnormal stress, tension, something happens with the body, muscle length becomes disrupted. And the reflexes that govern the muscles, that protect the muscles, go crazy. So you see some aberrant muscle behavior. You see hypersensitivity of the muscles in terms of movement. They're getting tighter. Some patients will come in and tell me, I feel tight, even when they're hypermobile. So you're looking at them, you're not really tight, but I feel that way. So that's something you want to be able to look at. We'll look at our monosynaptic reflexes and our proprioceptive reflexes. With today's interventions, we're going to tune into those reflexes, modify them to help people move more easily, more functionally. So let's look inside the muscle spindle. You remember the muscle spindle has within it extrafusal and intrafusal fibers. Inside the muscle spindle, the extrafusal fibers send information to the alpha motor neuron in the spinal cord, and when they get too excited, that makes the muscle contract. So it's a facilitatory influence to the muscle. It responds to changes in the length of the muscle. If a muscle's getting too long, what might happen? 
could be damaged, right? Could tear. So we need to know that the muscle can contract to protect itself if somehow there's an external force causing too much lengthening. Intrafusal fibers go into the gamma motor neuron system in the spinal cord. And what those are really doing is telling the muscle, okay, you need to contract because not only is the length changing, but the rate at which that length is changing might be too fast, too slow. And especially if the muscle is lengthening too quickly, it's hard to control that, hard to prevent the tearing. So both of these systems are our alarm systems. When they become upset, it makes the muscle hypersensitive to stretch. That sensitivity to stretch is called muscle spindle bias. All the muscles have a preset neural sensitivity to stretch. And when there's an injury, this becomes disrupted. Other receptors are known as the Golgi tendon organs. These have the opposite effect. Golgi tendon organs are present in the ends, the attachments of the muscle at the tendons, and they monitor also the muscle tone. But when they're stretched by, say, a sharp, sudden muscle contraction, that's going to inhibit the muscle. It lets the muscle know, well, don't contract too hard, because you might tear the attachments, the origin and insertion. So Golgi tendon organs are also a good security system, but if they're hypersensitive, and they keep firing, they're going to weaken the muscle through this consistent inhibition. So we could look at both sides of the extremes. You could either have muscle spindles exciting the muscle, making it too sensitive to stretch, very reactive, or Golgi tendon organs becoming hyperstretched and inhibiting or weakening the muscle. And we'll be working with both of those. This whole process is called facilitation. Stress overexcites the nervous system, whether it's a stress from a disease process, trauma, some kind of abnormal tension is developed, and that overloads the spinal cord. Sometimes those afferent impulses are so great that they go into multiple levels of the spinal cord and start expanding into other segments, segments of muscles that possibly weren't involved in the injury. Then you see these crazy things developing, like complex regional pain syndrome. You've heard of that. This can happen at both at the local level, which is the myofascial level. Individual muscles will develop trigger points. Tight bands in the muscle. We call them taut bands, right? If they tighten for a long time, they become fibrotic and thickened. That's sometimes you get that crunchy feeling in the muscle. So this is something that happens at the local facilitated segment level, maybe a single muscle. Also, it can happen across many segments of the spinal cord. If there's so much pain and so much afferent input into the spinal cord, it overflows into other segments. And you get what's called a segmental facilitated reflex. This will also start affecting the autonomic system, which is also supplied by those segments. You'll see some vasoconstriction, changes in the skin, okay? pain levels increase. So a lot of other things are happening. Say you overdo it. I did this one day. I decided, you know, gas was really expensive this summer. It was like $5.50 a gallon, and I have a boat. So I love to take the kids. I get all my nieces and nephews, pile them in the boat. We go out. But at those prices, we decided, let's try rowing. So. <laughs> Now, I haven't rowed in a few years other than, you know, a little raft. So we're rowing. You go out for an hour, and I'm rowing. We're having a great time. Kids are loving it. Beautiful day. And I decided after rowing out for an hour, oh, look at the time. We have to go back. Now what do I have to do? Row all the way back. But my biceps are already screaming, oh, you didn't prepare for this. Here's my biceps with a giant trigger point, sending afferent impulses into the spinal cord saying, Moron, shouldn't have been overdoing it. You should know better, right? The next day, I go to treat my patients. And I have them on the table, and I'm trying to reach, and I can't extend my arm because my biceps is so tight from all that overstretching and pulling repeatedly, the overuse. And that's what happens. We get too many afferent impulses with the pain into the spinal cord, sending efferent impulses back, telling the muscle to contract to protect itself, but also vasoconstricting in the area. And that vasoconstricting is that autonomic response. That decreases the oxygen, adds to the pain, and can further add to this pain cycle that we often see with trigger points. We like to interfere by treating those trigger points with the strain, counter strain, or positional release therapy. Trigger points are defined by Dr. Janet Travell. Dr. Travell's book, The Trigger Point Manual, defines trigger points as a hyperirritable area lying within a muscle or its associated fascia, that when you push on it, People might twitch, they might jump, they make noise, right? They start screaming, ow, that hurts, that hurts. So you have these hidden indicators that there's a dysfunction in the body. And that's what we're defining as trigger points. That's what we're looking for today in our assessment. Trigger points have actually been studied on EMGs, 
And many of these studies are showing that there is a persistent contraction of selected sarcomeres within the trigger point area. Not the whole muscle contracts, but some of the cells at a time. And when that happens, you have too much calcium buildup. You remember that calcium makes the muscle contract, right? You use that up, you start using up oxygen, create ischemic responses, more pain, which gives more impulses to the spinal cord to protect and tighten up, which causes more contraction, more ischemia. So you have this pain cycle. We're looking to break that pain cycle that's indicated by the trigger point using today's techniques. Now here's what it looks like if it's overflowing into several segments of the spinal cord. This is a good example that I've seen in the literature in the Journal of Manual and Manipulative Therapy by Collins et al. And they had a girl come in who was 14 years old. She was healthy, had a simple ankle sprain. Now, I would be thrilled if someone came into my office with a simple ankle sprain. I see people with like five different diagnoses, and they fell down the stairs, and they had a car accident last year. And on top of that, they have fibromyalgia, so they're a trigger point from head to toe, right? A little more complex. Get somebody in with a simple ankle sprain. They're in, they're out. Their statistics look great, right? But this girl did not have that situation. They did standard physical therapy. Oh, let's get some modalities on there. We'll get the swelling down, we'll brace her, partial weight bearing. Instead of getting better with the standard therapy, usually works, right? She was getting worse. Instead of the pain just in her ankle, it started becoming painful throughout her foot, up her leg, and becoming more and more sensitive, swollen, you know how the skin gets somewhat bluish sometimes, shiny, glossy, and that pain was so sensitive you could barely touch her foot. So what situation are we describing here? RSD, right? Reflex sympathetic dystrophy. In the newer times, they call that complex regional pain syndrome. If you're an antique, you might remember it's called pseudex atrophy. So that's an older name. They keep changing the names to protect the innocent. So this is what she was developing they decided, let's try something to eliminate some of this tenderness in her leg. And they used strictly strain counter strain. It was the only intervention for a period of time. Typically 30 to 45 minutes, a couple days a week. Significant results. She was able to tolerate movement again, increased her range of motion, increased her strength, got back to walking, and of course got back into normal exercise programs with the physical therapist. In this situation, the original trigger point was sending the usual impulses into the spinal column, sending impulses back for protection, tightening up, vasoconstricting. But the pain somehow radiated across many spinal segments, sending messages to other muscles, creating secondary trigger points. And those secondary trigger points, with their spasm, more vasoconstriction. Interesting, though, if you remember in the autonomic nervous system, that travels through the spine as well. So if you have impulses going in, not just the muscular system, be affected. But visceral organs can also be affected. I'm sure you've had patients complaining and they come in, oh, I have pain during my menstrual cycle. I have cramps in my stomach, but I'm getting pain in my back too, or pain down the leg. Because visceral problems can refer to the body. Body problems through the autonomic system can refer to the viscera. Sometimes lower digestive problems, irritable bowel is a great one, spastic colon, cramps in the lower abdomen, you know, usually from poor digestion or stress can also create trigger points, usually in the sacrum, the back. So you get these referred points. Treating those points can also help that problem and relax the viscera. The term strain counter strain was developed by Dr. Lawrence Jones back in the 50s. He was an osteopath. He practiced manual medicine, manipulation, family practice. Great guy. Uh, he is no longer with us, but he was wonderful. I had the chance to learn with him directly. Um, in doing the strain counter strain, he discovered this, that Treating a patient with general manipulation didn't always work. You know, you get the person all doubled over. Oh, I bent for the soap, but I can't get up. They're like a pretzel. And he might work on them and find, gee, nothing's working. I have another patient waiting. You know how sometimes you back up patients because somebody has an emergency or you're just not getting results or you don't want to leave them hanging? So he'd say, you know, get as comfortable as possible. Just lay on the table, sit, whatever you have to do. I'll come back in a few minutes and try to work with you a little bit. When he came back, he started to discover people with the same dysfunctions assumed the same comfortable position. So he said, wow, they've had a strain. If I put them in the comfortable position, it tends to make the strain lessen. Less pain, less spasm. And he put together a system of identifying that certain trigger points were associated with certain somatic dysfunctions, joint dysfunctions. And there were positions that eased those joint dysfunctions and helped people get back to normal postural symmetry. 
less spasm, better mobility. So he said, hey, let's create this whole system of strain, counter strain. Later on, after Dr. Jones has left us, some other people were creating new counter strain positions. But because they weren't Dr. Jones, I guess they changed the name and called it positional release. So it's basically the same work. It's a technique using tender points or trigger points that there's an indicator of a dysfunction in the joint. And we're going to work with that by eliminating the tenderness with a comfortable position. Now the characteristics of our positional release, you need to be able to position in such a way that the person is comfortable. You need to be able to find the trigger point so you know what to test before and after to see if it worked. And this is thereby an indirect release. We're going to be passively moving the patient into a position that feels good for that individual trigger point. Okay. Tender points can be identified. They're generally tense areas. They're tender to the touch. They could be superficial or deep. Remember that muscles are different layers of depth in the body. So if you are at the superficial muscles, the trigger point may be sensitive to light palpation. If it's a deep muscle under other layers, you might need to dig in a little deeper to find it. So use the level of palpation force that allows you to feel the resistance from that muscle tension in the body. It allows you to palpate that taut band. And that's something you learn by experience, is practicing. Then we get patients come in, they're like, oh, you know, when I push here, it hurts down here. And the doctor said I was crazy because those aren't connected. I said, well, unless you got amputated at the waist, sweetheart, they're very connected. <laughs> What connects us across the back? Muscles, rectus spinal muscles from the occiput to the sacrum, the iliac crest. So anywhere along those erectors that there's trigger points can affect the tension through the rest of those muscles and their fascia, their connective tissue. So we know they're related. These tender points or trigger points are often correlated very highly with acupuncture points, neurolymphatic points. So if you learn a little bit about those systems, oriental medical system, you might also see some correlation there. There are many trigger points in the body. You could look at great books like those of Dr. Leon Chetow, who has made some trigger point charts of common trigger points in the body. You could take courses with the Jones Institute. So basically going to be doing a passive range of motion treatment. And what's the CPT code for passive range of motion? Therex, right? Therapeutic exercise. So if you want to bill for this, one of the available codes is 97110. 97110. The code that I feel is more appropriate because we are re-educating the neuromuscular system. We're tapping into those reflexes that hold abnormal tension, so I recommend to use the neuromuscular re-education code, and that's CPT code 97112. So our theories, this is basically the theories are based on the work of Dr. Lawrence Jones and others, Dr. Kaur, Dr. Ed Stiles, and they say they're correcting a somatic dysfunction. A somatic dysfunction is basically a joint dysfunction, biomechanical alteration of tension across a joint. We learned way back in school, muscles have to have a certain length tension relationship to work effectively. If a muscle's too short, can it contract strongly when it's all bunched up? Not very well. So we would call that active insufficiency. You rem might remember this from biomechanics. If a muscle is overstretched and it's too long, can it contract efficiently? No, that's called passive insufficiency. If it's too long, the actin and myosin filaments are too far apart to get together and get a strong contraction. So biomechanical disadvantages occur when you have muscles too tight on one side of the joint. Of course, that means the muscles are doing what on the other side? Overstretched, right? So we're going to be correcting this somatic dysfunction. And what's interesting is Jones's theory has actually been proven by some studies. And most of the studies on strain counter strain are using that term, strain counter strain, not positional release. And most of them are found in the Journal of the American Osteopathic Association. One study here um, had looked by Howell et al., group of researchers, looked at trigger points, tender points, in the lower legs as a result of Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis. They did a few different studies. And they did EMGs before and after doing just strain counter strain and found a significant difference in the reflexes of the gastroc muscle. And th those are specific reflexes that are highly studied on EMGs, not to bore you with all the details, but there was a significant difference just from doing the positional release. So we know it does affect reflexes. We've seen it on EMG. Somatic dysfunctions are something you could write about in your notes. Do you guys know what a soap note is? <laughs> Subjective, right? Objective, assessment plan, just one style of note writing, but it's very, very common. So subjective, 
patient complains of something. Does Blue Cross care what the patient complains about? What about United Healthcare? Oxford? Anybody care what the patient complains about? We might. Okay, but the subjective changes will not get you paid, will not get reimbursement. So we want to make sure we have objective measures, right? Objective. Objective makes us happy because it gets what? Gets us paid. This is good. So you get your objective and you observe. What do you see? Forward, and I'll abbreviate here forward head posture. They're rotated to the right, and they're side bent to the right. So it's easy to describe the posture. The right scapula is elevated. I generally write it out in my notes, but in the interest of the brevity here, we're going to just abbreviate it. So we see the posture. It's going to be postural distortion. You can palpate. Start poking around in there. What do they feel? Palpate the rubber traps. I think about the muscles that tilt them to the right upper traps, scalenes, right splenius, levator, right? These muscles coming back to us a little bit, erectors on the right. So you palpate those and you decide, let me write down what happened with my palpation. So we palpate and we find that they have trigger points. Lots of big trigger points. And you find it in the right upper trap you poke at it, and they jump clear off the table. Oh, that really hurt. So do you write in the note, that really hurt? No, you have to grade this. How much did it hurt, my darling? On a scale of 0 to 10. 0 is no pain. 10 is the worst pain you could imagine. It's like, oh, that was a 9. So you have pain scale, 9 out of 10 for that trigger point. And for each and every trigger point that you find, name the muscle. And maybe it was right upper trap muscle belly. Maybe it was the origin, the insertion. Be specific, because you want to recheck this again later. So give them a pain rating scale, 0 to 10. And then you could check also. Look, she might have a loss of range of motion. So what do you think? Someone's all bunched up like this. What motion is difficult? Left lateral flexion, perhaps. So you do your range of motion testing. And you find that left, we'll call it left side bending, is only from 0 to 10 degrees. It would be nice if she had a little more than that, right? You may find that left rotation is only 0 to 15 degrees. And you can document this. So take out your goniometer, do some measurements. This problem might even weaken a patient. Could you imagine? So you could look and see muscle weakness. How do we measure that? Manual muscle test. I like to use a Nicholas handheld dynamometer. It's a fabulous handheld force gauge that can measure how many kilograms of force a muscle can generate or how many pounds. Depends on how you want to measure it. It also gives you a certain time to peak torque and so on in the muscle. But it's an easy way to get an objective measure. What is her strength before and after an individual treatment? Strength can change within an individual treatment. And that's what I love about strain counter strain. Initially, it was developed for pain reduction. Newer studies have shown that it also increases strength because we are decreasing the neurogenic inhibition that's caused by pain. So I put my patient on the table. Face up, I do a standard manual muscle test of neck flexion. Say, how much can you pick up your head off the table? Now, we remember that if she can pick up her head through a full range of motion against gravity, that's a 3 out of 5, right? 5 out of 5 is normal. 0 is nothing. So 3 out of 5, she could lift against gravity. This woman had a 3 minus. She could only pick up part of the range of motion against gravity half her range. So we'd say her manual muscle test of neck flexion was 3 minus out of 5. I could have done extension and other tests, but you get the idea. You want something to measure before and after. I may find that her neck disability index, she may be 46% disabled. We would like her 0% disabled, right? Maybe the next visit I give her the neck disability index again, and she's down a 25% disability. I said, look, your disability went down significantly. You must be doing your home program. So we measure this, and you can measure before and after. So look for all of these objective changes. This way you have it all down. Then you do your magic. Maybe I decide, oh, she's so tight, I might want to warm her up and soften the muscles with some ultrasound. Perhaps I start with the modality, some ultrasound. And then I start to work on her soft tissue, and she says, oh, it's too painful to stretch, too painful for you to dig in there. So instead, I might use positional release, counter strain. 
position her neck in such a way that we reduce the pain in the trigger point, reduce the spasm in the muscle, and she can move more easily. So then after I do those interventions, I'll give her a home program, give her some exercise to do, and I'll remeasure the strength, the manual muscle test, the trigger point. How is it now when I poke at your shoulder here, at your upper traps? Oh, I think the pain is about a 2 out of 10 now. Great, we had a 7-point reduction in the pain. So this is great documentation, and it's documentation you could do within a visit. I would find by the end of a treatment that she's able to pick her head up fully against gravity and even take a little resistance. That's wonderful, because now we see, look, we have an objective change. I could measure it with a handheld dynamometer, and that's even more objective. So use these tests to show that something has changed. And remember, everything in the body is connected, right? Do you think she had just a problem with her neck? Right, if her shoulder's up, you know, she may be pulling into her back. The body's connected. So I like to look at the body holistically. We have what you call kinetic chain theory, the tensegrity model. Tensegrity is just a term for architectural integrity in the body. Right? If stuff is not lined up properly, it's not going to last too long. Imagine we're in a hotel right now. If the foundation of the hotel was crooked, would you want to be sitting here enjoying this seminar? probably be out the door in a heartbeat, right? Building might fall. But in our bodies, our muscles know, hey, if we're crooked downstairs, we don't want the person to fall, so the muscles will tighten up and try to compensate and hold us in place. And every now and then, those compensations give way, don't they? <laughs> People make appointments, they come and see us. So we want to make sure we realign the biomechanical integrity, have good symmetry, so the muscles are not overworking, not becoming too tired, fibrotic, etc. So everything's connected. So you want to restore the biomechanical integrity, restore the normal length tension relationships across the joints. This is basic kinesiology. This is not that involved to do. So we're going to tune into our neuromuscular reflexes today, decide if they're abnormal in a patient using the evidence of a trigger point and limited range of motion and or weakness. We see there's a problem, and then we'll use our positioning this morning with strain counter strain to reduce that sensitivity to reset the muscle spindle sensitivity to stretch, so it's not so hypersensitive. Then this afternoon, the second half of the seminar, we'll use muscle energy therapy, specific contractions of muscle to either increase range of motion or to increase strength. So there's a follow through, you need the whole picture. We'll find tender points in our partners. We're not treating them as a tender point per se, but we're using them as an indicator that there is a joint dysfunction. We can call that a somatic dysfunction. And a little trial and error, of positioning someone passively will identify a position of comfort. Where is the point in the range which the pain reduced in the tender point or trigger point, they become less sensitive, and you actually feel the muscle soften under your finger. You really palpate that. The theory is that there is abnormal proprioceptive feedback after an abnormal stress, tension, trauma, etc. We want to alter that spindle sensitivity to make it less sensitive to stretch after an injury. And this is based on Jones's theory of strain counter strain. He calls it a spontaneous release by positioning. Counter strain is a mild strain applied in a direction opposite the original strain. Okay, and Dr. Jones made certain rules, and rules are meant to be why? How about followed? <laughs> How about decide for your individual patient what's appropriate based on your clinical reasoning process? <laughs> so sometimes the rules have to change. Jones says the pain is based on position. If you put the muscle on a stretch, it's going to make it more sensitive, make those muscle spindles kick in. The joint dysfunction is basically a re reaction to some kind of strain. Maybe it was a slip and fall. Maybe it was a car accident. He says the antagonists hold the tender points. We'll take a look at that. I don't think that's always true, but you can check it out on your own patient. We're going to find a position of comfort, a POC, that makes that tenderness in the trigger point reduce, makes that muscle relax. And then we're going to hold that there for about 90 seconds. Some people who have high tone or central nervous system dysfunction might need to hold it longer. And it's been documented by some researchers, like Dr. Sharon Weiselfish has looked at people with CNS dysfunction, spasticity, and found they take like 5 to 20 minutes. So we might position them in a position of comfort, walk away, treat another patient while they're relaxing in that position for a while. Just another concept. When you take them out of that position, your rate of return to neutral should be slow. I'm a New Yorker, I'm always in a hurry. But here, I have to slow down. So just imagine going in slow motion, 
you don't want to reactivate that muscle spindle stretch reflex. You want it to calm down. So if you're finding it's not working, make sure that the patient let go. Make sure that you brought them out of the position slowly. I like to explain to patients, look, you have this pain in here. Yes, you're stiff, you're a little weak. We call that a joint dysfunction. Okay? Your muscles are acting as if they're still being strained even though the accident was four months ago. We never re-educated your muscles that it's safe to let go. I'm going to put you in a position that tells your muscles, it's okay to let go now. All the strain is gone. And that's what strain counter strain is. Okay? The muscle spindle has been implicated as the culprit of maintaining the joint dysfunction. Dr. Jones says, when you're treating, position the muscle with the trigger point in its maximally shortened position. So as an example, the biceps would be totally flexed at the elbow, totally flexed at the shoulder, totally supinated at the forearm. Now, frankly, here's a rule I've broken many times. Some patients feel that's such a strain to go to a maximally shortened position. What muscle's being strained when this is happening? Triceps, lats, <laughs> pronators, etc. So you're putting a stretch on the antagonist muscles. That's what's getting the agonist, the biceps, to relax. Remember reciprocal inhibition? Stretch one muscle, it activate it, turns off the muscle on the other side of the joint. So we have a nice reciprocal inhibition. Guess what? You could get that without maximally shortening. For biceps, I might just get some release with some elbow flexion and supination. I might not need to elevate the shoulder. But if that's not working, I'll try it. So you could use any of the actions of the muscle, see what works on your patient at the moment you're trying. Because it may be a little different treatment to treatment. We do this in slow motion. Make sure you hold it for at least 90 seconds. Give that muscle spindle a chance to re-educate, to let go. It does take longer if they have spasticity. And we're looking for the final outcomes. Decreased tissue tension, you could palpate on your finger. Decreased pain, measure using the pain rating scale. And interesting, increased strength. Very frequently that muscle can now be more activated. So you'll find a measurable increase in strength. That was not initially included in Dr. Jones' information. But in some of our students at Toro College in Manhattan, um, I used to teach there at Toro College. And you know, when you're teaching, you know, students are always bribed to get to do some study that the professor likes. <laughs> so uh, one of my fellow professors and I both enjoy counter strain. And this Dr. Wong had some students starting to do a counter strain study looking at the hip abductors. And the study was published in the Journal of Manual and Manipulative Therapy. So I can reference that for you later in the day. Fabulous study. We looked at normal patients who had tender points, trigger points in their hip abductor muscles, did a simple positioning, shortening, and within 90 seconds, the pain not only went down, but the strength was significantly better. And that was accepted through a good peer-reviewed research journal. We looked at the strength using my Nicholas Manual Muscle Tester handheld dynamometer, and that's been shown to be valid and reliable in the literature. So our treatment principles takes about 90 seconds. This is easy. We flex the flexors that have the trigger points, extend the extensors. Just passively do the action that muscle would ordinarily do on its own. Shorten it, and you turn off that abnormal reflex. Little precaution, sometimes people are sore the next day. A little delayed onset muscle soreness may occur. Now the muscle is working differently. Perhaps part of the muscle that was not working before was inhibited is now working. It's working differently. They might be sore. Let them know. Teach them exercise before they leave. If they're very sore, you can give them some ice, teach them how to use ice. Typically, it's very mild. It's almost like they did some extra exercise today. They might get a little sore tomorrow. So our indications, muscle guarding, acute injury, joint hyper or hypomobility can all set up trigger points, abnormal fascial tension. And of course, any of these problems can contribute to deterioration in functional abilities in ADL. You can help restore those using this as part of our treatment program. OK, the results you're looking for, you should be able to normalize the muscle tone. You can feel that tight muscle softening underneath your fingers. So you should be palpating and evaluating. You want to normalize the fascial tension, get better range of motion, measure with your goniometer, better strength. You can measure that with a dynamometer. And because this also relates to the autonomic reflexes, you might even increase circulation in that area by decreasing that inhibitory reflex, decreasing that vasoconstriction. So you get some nice results. Contraindications, the bottom line highlighted, anytime motion is contraindicated. We are doing passive motion for patients. So if that passive motion is contraindicated by a fracture, an open wound, an infection, or so on, maybe some medical hardware need not be disturbed, 
Maybe they just had a spinal fusion that's not supposed to be disturbed. Those may be times motions contraindicated. So if you're concerned about whether or not they're allowed to be moved passively, you know, do a great examination or refer to someone who can do an appropriate evaluation and make the appropriate referral. Perhaps they've had an orthopedic surgery and you don't know if that tendon repair is ready for passive movement. Check with the surgeon. Get it in writing. We're going to expect that you would do a full examination. Again, if you're not doing a full eval, refer to someone who does. Some of these people need x-rays, MRIs, blood tests. If that's not something you do in your office, you might want to refer out for that. You may have a patient coming in with neck pain who gets dizzy when she moves her head. You want to move her head and have her pass out without having her check with a neurologist. So this type of thing. Do a full exam. If you find there's trigger points, there's loss of mobility, maybe some muscle weakness, then you can scan, palpate, and record all the trigger points that you find. Give them numbers. How much did that hurt? That was a nine. How much did that hurt? Oh, that was a two. And record those trigger points and then prioritize. Which is the worst one? So I try to treat the most painful trigger point first. And then some of the trigger points around it might actually disappear from treating the primary painful trigger point. This way you don't have to treat a million. I'll usually treat maybe two or three trigger points in a day. And then I move into my muscle energy, my exercise, whatever functional things I need to do with patients. So this is part of a whole treatment plan. It's not the only treatment. And the techniques that I show you today that are listed in your manual are from Dr. Jones's work. The names of them are from Dr. Jones. And we're going to do some things you find typically in the clinic. Neck pain, back pain, elbow pain, etc. So we'll go through several joints of the body. And by the time we're ready for our second part, our muscle energy, you should have a concept of how to do this on just about any muscle. For the posterior neck, posterior cervical spine, we're going to be palpating points just along the spinous processes over that upper trapezius and erector muscle group. For those muscles, most of those muscles are neck extenders. Some of those muscles rotate to the head to the opposite side, like your upper traps will rotate your neck to the opposite side. So to reduce a trigger point there, we'll position them with their neck extended, side bent toward the painful point, and rotate it away. Now if that's not working, you may recall that don't some of the muscles in the neck rotate to the same side? Others rotate to the opposite side. Guess what? If it didn't work to rotate away, what could you try? Rotating toward. Okay, so upper traps rotates away. Erectors rotate toward. So if it's a really deep trigger point, you might think about, well, toward might work better because erectors are deep. If it's at the surface, it's more upper trap. Remember, muscles are in layers. So really remember your muscle actions. That will make you very precise in applying today's techniques. For the upper traps, what's that prime action? Upper trapezius shrugs the shoulder, elevates the shoulder. So you might find in someone who can't move their neck because maybe they have an acute herniated disc, you can work on the upper traps just by passive scapula elevation. And that could work very nicely as well. Or you could work from the neck by extending, side bending to that side. So you have choices. Knowing the muscles have several actions give you choices. Then we'll look into some of the posterior lumbar points. Jones calls these posterior lumbar points, but they're actually in the gluteal region. So we'll use the ilium and its landmarks as a reference, and we'll find what he calls the posterior third lumbar, posterior fourth lumbar trigger points. Just memorize your muscles. Keep a list of muscle actions on your wall in the office so you can refer to ones maybe you haven't seen for a while. Oh, yeah, that's what that one does. Okay, we'll palpate for the trigger point, rate it on the pain scale with a number, and then experiment to see Get your partner ready, get them in as comfortable a position as possible, and then passively move them to reduce the pain in the trigger point. And it's also fun to check, gee, did they get any better range of motion? What else changed with that? Now, in this, you see from the picture that posterior cervical muscles generally are neck extensors, so we're going to need to extend the neck in order to shorten those muscles. Most of the muscles on one side, side bend the muscle to that side. Some of them rotate to the same side, some rotate away. And I'll mention this as we go through it. So if one rotation doesn't work to limit your patient's trigger point, which way will you go? The other rotation. So this is not rocket science. Um, it basically, if you stick to your kinesiology principles of what is that muscle action, 
How can I produce the movement passively that that muscle does to shorten it? You should get good results. Here's the other thing. If that doesn't work, and the trigger point is still active, they're just as painful, what else might be going on? Maybe they have a tumor and that's what's hurting them, and counter strain will not help at all. That means they need referral, right? It's not working. That's an extreme. Perhaps they're inflamed. So this is not going to make inflammation go away right away. But if it's abnormal neuromuscular tension that's causing the pain and the problem, abnormal muscle spindle reflex telling the muscle to tighten, making it contract persistently with those tight bands, those trigger points, that will reduce with the positioning. So if you're not getting a reduction right away, give the patient also a moment to relax. Sometimes it takes people a while to let go, you know, when you're handling them, they're either helping you to move them, or they're fighting you. You know how people do a little bit of guarding. So be aware of that. Give them a moment to relax. If you're fully supporting the patient's body part, they're going to let go. They'll relax. If you're not, and your hands are shaking because you're trying to hold their head up in midair with no support, that would be a little bit of a challenge. They'll feel your tension, they'll tighten up, and thereby the technique won't work. So make sure your patient as fully relaxed as possible. Make sure that you are relaxed as possible. In the clinic, we like to have things like bolsters, pillows, etc., available that we could boost someone up with a pillow or a bolster. Okay? So let's pretend that Eddie has some trigger points in his posterior cervical spine. Now, Eddie mentioned that he had a history of a car accident years ago. Sometimes his neck gets a little stiff on the left side, but there was no major trauma. So check with your partner, of course, with your patient before you examine them. Does he get dizzy when he moves his head around or tilts his head? If so, what will you do? Yeah, refer. Maybe do a vertebral artery test to see, is he having a problem with that? Um, if so, someone says that right away, immediate referral to a neurologist. I don't want to get involved with someone having a problem there's even documentation of people stroking out during a vertebral artery test because there's a decrease of blood flow to the brain. So if someone's getting dizzy, nauseous, or just very uncomfortable, we don't want to be moving their head into extension, rotation, or side bending. And vertebral artery test is generally the test for that. We refer them out and see how is their circulation going. Now, this is just a flat table. Sometimes in the clinic we have tables with adjustable headrests, which are a lot easier to use, but here, if you have a flat table, sit at the head of the table, put a pillow or something to rest his head on, on your lap, and it's easy to extend side bend with good support. Okay, Eddie, I'm going to be feeling the muscles at the back of your neck here and seeing if there's any sensitivity or pain. If you have any pain where I'm poking, can you let me know? Mm -hmm. And then we'll ask Eddie, tell us on a scale of 0 to 10, how much does it hurt when I press? And the amount of pressure will be basically to match the resistance that I feel in his muscles. Compare right side and left side. Come just below the base of your head in the middle. The first spinous process, the first bony prominence you feel at the midline is the spinous process of C2. So palpate just lateral to C2. Go down one bump, one level. C3, palpate there. C4, and I'm doing this with Eddie as we go along. I'm feeling, does he have tight bands in his muscles? Do his muscles twitch when I roll my finger across them during the palpation? We got a little tension right there. Any pain in any of those? Just a little tight right there. A little tight right here? Mm -hmm. Okay, so C6, 7 on the right. I'm going to do a little bit of extension. Upper cervical points require very little extension. Side bend toward that side. And you may or may not try a little rotation. And just rest your head there. Comfortable? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then we'll hold this position for 90 seconds. So it's easy to find in the middle, especially, of the upper trap muscle belly, there's often trigger points. I mean, who doesn't have a trigger point here, right? Any tension in any of these spots? Right there. there. And feel a few spots. You don't go just for the first one. A little tension here, too. There seems worse. Yeah. Okay. Zero to ten? About five. And you put your right hand on your belly. Just let it rest there. So I'll just reach over, grab his elbow, just go right up through the humerus, and I can palpate at the same time that I'm moving his shoulder, just using the humerus as a lever. And just let that kind of rest there. 
So you want him to relax. You might want to hold it in that shrug position. Any different here? Yeah. Any numbers? Uh, maybe a two. Maybe a two. So not a zero yet. Let's see maybe a little bit more elevation. Give him a moment to relax it. Any difference here? Yeah, gone. Gone. OK. Now, just watch. Are you comfy to stay like that? I don't have to be touching him for this to work. The pure point of strain counter strain is that the position is doing the work. And I could come back, and if you're good at your palpation, you could come back to the same point and know where you are. How is it now? Good. Good. So being touching the patient is not part of the treatment per se. I like to have my hands on the patient because I can feel when that muscle is relaxing. Okay? I can also take this time to say do a modality. If I'm working on his upper trap, I could put him in a counter strain position. Say you wanted to use some heat and electrotherapy. You could go ahead and have the hot pack and electrodes on and leave him in this position as long as he's comfortable. If the shoulder shrug was not enough, I could have added the other actions of the upper trapezius, which would be side bending to the same side, extension, and rotation away from the trigger point. Posterior lumbars. Okay, so we're going to find some points in your hips, and I'm just going to use your left hip as an example. The upper lateral glutes have some tender points, and they're called the posterior lumbar tender points because they have to do with the posterior lumbar muscles. We'll pretend he has a back problem and he's having some pain or trigger points in the posterior lumbar region, the gluteal region. According to Dr. Jones, the third lumbar point, P3L, posterior third lumbar point, is found by using the iliac crest as a landmark. The third lumbar point is found three centimeters inferior to the iliac crest, seven centimeters lateral to the PSIS, approximately. We'll pretend that he does have a tender spot. Let's say he has, say, an eight on a scale of zero to 10, right in this posterior third lumbar. If you're thinking about what muscle is under my fingers, oh, gluteus maximus. The origin of the gluteus maximus, iliac crest, lateral border of the sacrum. It comes inferior lateral to the greater trochanter and the iliotibial band. So it's helpful if you just cradle the leg, hold under the thigh here, and say you get some extension. OK, let me try adding a little bit of abduction, maybe a little external rotation. Once you're there, this is a good time to get that pillow to support him so that you don't feel like you have to be holding his leg up the whole time. But I'm just going to bring him back. If the trigger point was reduced after the 90 seconds, bring him back to neutral. And we'll just look at a different option of positioning. Eddie, lay on your side facing the audience. Imagine if I was extending his hip. And he said, oh, my back is killing me. You put my leg down. It's really hurting my back. So to help that with the back, if you want to keep the back a little flat or a little bit more comfortable, Bend your bottom knee up to your chest. Hold it with your hand. And just keep that steady right there. Comfortable? Mm -hmm. So say I'm on a point here, we'll say that the P3L is on the right side this time. I could easily do my lateral rotation. I want to just pull it up a little bit. There we go. And just rest your leg. I could do just lateral rotation and abduction and still treat the glute without extending the hip. You see how this is just another option. And sideline with the bottom knee bent and hip bent will keep the back a little flatter, a little more of a posterior pelvic tilt, and there's a lot less discomfort for those people with tight hip flexors or back problems, especially the elderly. They're not comfortable on their belly, so try that. The last choice would be supine. I could hang his leg off the table, keep his opposite knee bent. Just an easy way to go. the posterior fourth lumbar, which is located at the lateral aspect of the hip. To find the P4L, palpate the iliac crest, palpate the greater trochanter of the hip, 
It'll be along the mid-axillary line, halfway between iliac crest and greater trochanter. This is actually in the gluteus medius muscle. So palpate, this is a hip abductor and medial rotator. So to release it, we use hip abduction and medial rotation. You can see that that leg rolled in at the foot. And then we're holding that for the gluteus medius. one would be the iliacus. The iliacus is a hip flexor muscle and according to Dr. Jones the tender point for iliacus is located in the lower abdominal region. Halfway between the umbilicus and the anterior superior iliac spine. So palpate, where is that bump right above where his hip flexes? Anterior superior iliac spine or ASIS. Here it is. So if you took a halfway point between these two right in the abdominal region, and point directly into the spine. I like to use where the tendon trigger point is. Come inferior and just medial to it, right over that inguinal ligament, you can palpate the iliopsoas tendon. So say he had some pain here, it was a six, we would want to passively flex the hip. So just cradle his leg, just bending your knee up toward your chest. So I might want to do a little more flexion, maybe add a little lateral rotation, and see how is it now. Oh, that, that made it go away, it's a zero now. Excellent. And then we'll hold this. Most of these iliopsoas trigger points take more than 90 seconds to release. We'll pretend that that's completely gone. Let it go in slow motion all the way down. And then, of course, you test again. How is it now? So the palpation is just to test. We don't keep poking. finding some points in the subscapularis. Start with the arm in neutral along the mid-axillary line would be neutral relative to shoulder flexion extension. To get there and find it, abduct his shoulder a little bit. Wait until you feel that scapula moving under your fingers here. There it is. Curl my fingers to the anterior border. So I'm on the trigger point, bring him back to neutral. And the treatment would be extension of the shoulder and internal rotation, which would be placing the hand behind the back. It's easy to manipulate this if you just hold him at the flexion in the elbow. Now, I could just let him rest like this. If you couldn't get to a zero, I'll hold the anterior surface of the shoulder and just retract a little bit. If you had a patient in the sitting position, you could approach the subscapularis from behind, come underneath the axilla. Please do not compromise the brachial plexus by digging into his armpit. You'll feel the bush lift your arm a little bit just to see if I could feel where the border of his scapula is and rest. I found the bone. I'm going to curl my fingers around the anterior surface. I could just, just let me bring your hand back here gently. You see how it's easy to do some of this just in sitting. You can use many different positions as far as sitting, supine, sideline, prone, whatever works for you to access that on your patient as long as they're relaxed. Find tender points here in the wrist, palpate from the lateral epicondyle, stensor caught by radialis, stensor digitorum communis, stensor caught by ulnaris. You could use your thumb or your fingertips, find a point, he gets a twitch reaction, use some gentle extension of the wrist, supination, and then holding. Now for the hamstrings, we're going to be palpating here and let's identify the origin and insertion so we know what muscles. There's three major hamstring muscles. The common origin is the ischial tuberosity. If you come down medially to the medial, I'm just going to bend your knee a little here. Medial to the knee joint, passing the medial knee, anteromedial proximal tibia, 
is the pes anserine tendon, right? It's a common tendon that has three muscles. In this case, semitendinosus is a hamstring that attaches here, but you also have the sartorius and the gracilis, which are not hamstrings, right? Okay, so let's just see. I wonder if he has any tenderness medially. Any tenderness in here? Okay, so he's good with that. Let's follow that semitendinosus up. If we come to the posterior medial proximal tibia, just below the knee joint, you're going to have the attachment of the semimembranosus, okay, the other medial hamstring. Any tenderness here? And then follow those tendons up. You could feel them if you just bend his knee a little and he tightens up. You could feel those tendons. I'm going to follow the tendons up and see. Sometimes the trigger point's in the muscle belly. Sometimes it's in the tendon. And I'll follow it up. Frequently, I find a big trigger point right in the middle of the posterior thigh. Let's now check the lateral hamstrings. That's going to be the biceps. Again, same origin, but the short head of the biceps come to the posterior lateral proximal tibia. The long head of the biceps comes to the lateral knee just at that fibula head. Check for tender points throughout the hamstrings, including the ischial tuberosity. If, say, he has a tender point in the medial hamstring, flex the knee, test the point again, still bothering, you could use a little bit of internal rotation, or you can extend his hip. I'm going to just pick up your leg and put some pillows under there. Some hip extension with the knee flexion. You okay with that knee? Mm -hmm. Feels good to me. Feels loose. And then that will get a nice trigger point reduction for the medial hamstring. I want them to see that I'm cradling his knee to protect his knee and I'm holding his hip. And back and then test the point again. There we go. Okay, Good. that's the hamstring. last. So yes, it released on the table today. Will the patient still have it later today? What about this afternoon? What about next week, next year? And I was very happy to say I have no clue. <laughs> okay, because there hasn't been enough randomized controlled clinical trials studying these techniques to say that this should last X number of days, weeks, or months. But here's my clinical experience speaking. Um, there are studies, and they're in the Journal of Manual and Manipulative Therapy, and particular studies done in the Journal of the American Osteopathic Association, and they looked at people with back pain. And they found that with counter strain, they rechecked the people with back pain six months after they were discharged, and did find that they still had range of motion that have improved, less pain in their back, and increased functional ability measured, I believe, by the Oswestry Back Disability Index. So that's one of the reasons I like to use the disability indices to see as the patient is progressing with therapy over a course of maybe a couple visits, can we document each one on a disability index and see if there's a change that's functional. And that type of functional change, I can mail right to Medicare, my back disability index or the hand disability index, whatever you're treating, you could send it out. So the only documentation I've seen is that six months later they did check for people with back pain. My typical response from working with patients in the clinic, say they come in and their back is just strained, they were lifting too many packages, they work at a job where they have to do heavy lifting, they strain the muscle, maybe they have a bulging disc, they come in, they're 10 out of 10. They can't stand up straight, they're limping, maybe they're using a cane, they're on a lot of medication. So this is like a classic patient. Maybe I get down to a seven or a six today. And he's not as antalgic, now he can walk up straight, he could walk a short distance without a cane. Okay, that's a nice start for today. That person who's very acute, I'm typically seeing two or three times a week. And I'm going to be doing many interventions, not just strain counter strain. But if they're primarily in pain and moving them makes it worse as far as active movement or stretching, I might want to calm down the trigger points first with the strain counter strain and then go into my muscle energy you know, contractions or stretching. I might want to need some mobilization on them. 
to readjust their vertebrae. It really depends on what they need. If someone is having a herniated or bulging disc, I might use a modality such as traction. So I won't be able to put them near a traction machine if stretching them is making them worse. I won't be able to get in and give them exercise if stretching is making them worse. So that's a prime time where I'll say, look, the neuromuscular system is really on a high alert. Those muscle spindles are very sensitive to stretch. Stretching hurts. Let's try non-stretching. Let's try counter strain. And that would be a perfect time I'd use counter strain first. And I would expect that their trigger point score, the pain score when they come into therapy, is lower each visit. Maybe the second visit he comes in with a 7 out of 10 on the pain scale. He leaves, he's a 3 out of 10. Comes back in next time, he's a 5 out of 10. It went back up again, he was doing his daily activities, aggravated it. Comes back in, now he's down to a 1. Next visit he comes in, he's a 9. What happened? Oh, I really tried to lift something again. I know you told me not to do it yet. But inevitably, people, life happens and people come in. If they're doing the same thing that caused that abnormal neuromuscular tension, they're going to rebuild their trigger point because the body will respond. So the key is, if the trigger point is there because they're too weak to do ADLs, we have to have strengthening programs. You know that takes some weeks to accomplish. If they're stiff and their stiffness is causing problems, because they've forgotten to stretch or they do things unevenly with their body, sitting at the computer with bad posture for hours, six to eight hours a day, that might cause problems. If we don't go ahead and show them the ergonomics, how do you sit at a computer with proper body mechanics? How do you break up your day instead of sitting there all day, get up, stretch, you know, do certain exercise? They'll rebuild the trigger point. So we need to look at the whole thing, what's happening with this person, that the problem's coming back. So if they're doing all the right things, the exercise is starting to work, they're carrying over, they're compliant with home programs, you figured out something that they're doing at work or home or during their sports that's aggravating the problem and you corrected it, the problem's gone. So we really work with each patient individually. If the problem is not going away, refer for extra examination. Run some extra tests, maybe there's something else you're missing. Okay, I had a, a young lady who came into me not long ago, wonderful young woman, about 23 years old, just finished graduating pharmacy school. And she was so excited. She went to her first job. She's working 12 hours a day. A little expensive living in New York. Most of us work two jobs. So 12 hours a day, she's screwing and unscrewing jar caps. And she didn't have to do that in school, and she's never done that in her life. Could you imagine how her wrist felt and arm from screwing and unscrewing childproof caps all day? So she came in with tennis elbow and a wrist sprain. She had a referral from an orthopedic surgeon. Now, most surgeons will do an x-ray when a patient comes in. Even if they don't think they need it, well, let's bill it out, so let's get that x-ray. She did not have an x-ray. I thought this was very curious. I said, you know, I'll do some mild stuff with you today. She had all the normal orthopedic textbook signs and symptoms of lateral epicondylitis, tendonitis of those wrist and finger extensors, a little bit in the flexors, and some pain over her wrist, over her distal radius, not the wrist joint. So I did some ultrasound to her forearm muscles. I did some gentle strain, counter strain. She thought it was magical. It went from a nine to a zero. She said, this is great. I gave her some very gentle exercise. And of course, I told her, you must take a break from all this screwing around with these jar caps, <laughs> right? Not a good thing to do. How about if you wore a brace for a little bit, give your wrist some support. It's very inflamed. And she said, oh, I can't. It's a new job. I'm afraid to tell them I hurt myself. I don't want to lose the job. And then the whole drama goes on. I said, well, then find somebody to pawn these jar tops off on. <laughs> Get someone else to do it for you. Maybe there's an intern. Maybe there's an aide there to help you. Maybe they have a machine they didn't tell you about to help put the caps on. You imagine that could be exhausting. She comes in the second visit. I felt great after therapy. The pain keeps waking me up at night. And then she comes in the third visit. She felt great after the second visit. Comes in, same thing. Trigger points back. Still has pain in the wrist. I said, you know... I know you went to an orthopedist and he's, you know, well regarded by your family or whoever sent you over there, but you really should have had an x-ray on your wrist. I have a bad feeling about this. You should be feeling much better because she did do less. She did some of the jar caps, but less. She went to a hand specialist I sent her to who took an x-ray. Guess what was giving her pain that's waking her up at night? Key, waking me up at night. Cancer. Okay, you hear that. This girl basically had more than a nose drip growing up. Perfectly healthy, very happy. No reason for her to have a giant cell tumor in her distal radius. Plus, she had tennis elbow on top of it. So here's a situation where this is not working. 
within a visit or two, something's missing. She went right in for surgery and had that removed twice. Okay, so of course she had to still work with the tennis elbow, but can you imagine that a giant cell tumor is infinitely more important than a tennis elbow? She ended up going into research or something. But just an example, do a full exam. If the full exam is not done, a piece is missing, they're not responding, you absolutely must refer for additional evaluation, right? Makes sense. Now, you may notice in the book, the pictures are slightly different than what I'm showing you. I'm doing that on purpose for everything so that you learn to be flexible. Some patients can't lay prone. Somebody else will be very cranky when you put them in supine. Maybe their shoulder hurts, their hip hurts. You need to know that you could change the person's position. Can you figure out how to treat a hamstring if the person's sitting in a chair? Can you figure out how to treat a hamstring by hanging their leg off a table, which is a picture in your manual, versus can't I do this in sideline? Knee extent, knee flexion, hip extension. So as long as you can position the joint to shorten the affected muscle holding the trigger point, you should be able to do that in most any position, sitting, supine, maybe even standing. Some of my runners who get the trolley horse in their hamstring, I'll show them how to do some of that positional release. So, you know, hold on to something with one hand, grab your other leg. They could do their own hip extension, knee flexion. We usually call that a quad stretch. Isn't a quad stretch a counter strain for the hamstring? So you can reason this out. Be aware there's lots of choices. That's the beauty of this book. Muscle energy therapy is a nice treatment technique to sequence after you get someone more comfortable using the positional release counter strain work. Often people are uncomfortable, they have pain, they get very cranky when you start moving them before they're ready. <laughs> and you may find that with the positional release we get them a little happier, a little more willing to pay that copay on the way out the door, they're feeling good, and then we like to squeeze in our exercise. There are studies that show that positional release strain counter strain works on its own to help people be more functional, but I found clinically there are things we need to do with people that strain counter strain simply doesn't manage, like growth strengthening, functional activities, this type of thing. Teaching patients home programs for stretching or working through more the myofascial component. When we're dealing with trigger points, there's two aspects. There's the abnormal neuromuscular tension that we are addressing, that excess mundle, muscle spindle bias that's going on. We're addressing that with the positional release. But if someone has had that bias going on for a while and they're tightening up over time, the connective tissue shortens and thickens. Excess collagen is laid down in the fascia. Collagenous crosslinks occur where the collagen is literally glued together and we need to get some soft tissue work such as massage, deep tissue work, myofascial work to start mobilizing those connective tissue restrictions. So it's very important to make sure that we have that component I'm not teaching that component today, but just be aware, it would be a great time to follow the positional release with some soft tissue work that really addresses the non-contractile elements, the connective tissue tightening and shortening. Positional release does not address that fibrotic tissue. It addresses the tension that caused that fibrotic tissue possibly to develop. Okay, so now we're going into some muscle energy therapy. This has many different names. The term muscle energy therapy comes from the work of Dr. Fred Mitchell. He's another osteopathic physician, and he had written about this back in the 1950s. He said, you know, I found out that simply manipulating the body sometimes is a little bit too heavy-handed for patients or didn't quite get the adjustment that he needed, and he started to notice that he could do small contractions of specific muscles and be able to realign or move the vertebrae back into a good symmetrical functional position. And he termed this use of muscle contraction muscle energy technique or muscle energy therapy. At the same time that muscle energy was being developed by Dr. Mitchell, Knott and Voss in the physical therapy field were developing what we were taught as PNF, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. So this is stuff we're familiar with. Same types of techniques, just a different name. Mitchell tended to use more of the muscle energy work on the spine for spinal somatic dysfunction. Knott and Voss did a little bit more full body work, more extremity work, 
in terms of getting patients functionally moving around, especially through a developmental sequence or specific recruitment patterns. Quadruped, kneeling, rolling over, this type of thing. They tended to work the muscle energy in diagonal patterns. So we're familiar with the PNF. Basically, it's the same concepts. Dr. Philip Greenman, who's also an osteopathic physician, he wrote the book Principles of Manual Medicine, and he has quite a bit of muscle energy work in that book, if this interests you. He's defined muscle energy as a manual medicine treatment utilizing voluntary contraction. So here's the hint. If your patient can't achieve a voluntary contraction, this intervention is not for them, right? So they need to be able to follow directions, right? be cooperative, and at least get a twitch contraction. So voluntary contraction, we're going to contract the muscle in a precisely controlled direction against varying levels of intensity of counterforce. Right? And that varying intensity is very important. We're going to modify how much force we use to assist or to resist a patient based on their tolerance and their abilities. Now, when I went to PT school back in the early 80s, we were taught, push on that patient as hard as you can, have them push back as hard as they can, and really crank and get them going. And I got this adorable name at my first job. I was at the Veterans Administration Medical Center in Manhattan, downtown. And I was walking down the hall one day, all new and green with my little PT skills of being the bone crusher. Yeah. I heard it, now, she, here she comes, the bone crusher. Look out, bone crusher's here. So I learned right, oh, I think I'm a little too heavy on these nice veterans <laughs> who we love dearly, God bless them. So I learned to be a little bit lighter. I started taking the myofascial courses, craniosacral courses. You don't have to mob everybody into oblivion. And I found I get actually better results learning the muscle energy. You can be more gentle. Yes, do I go deep sometimes? Absolutely. But I always like to stay within the tolerance of the patient as much as possible. And I suggest you do the same. If someone is fresh out of a surgery, they're in a lot of pain. I've had orthopedic surgery before. It's not comfortable. You don't want anybody cranking on you right after a surgery. But don't we do that? Often the next day. Oh, got that total knee replacement. Hey, let's start bending and moving you. Patient's eyeballs bulging right out of her head, right? This is where the Vicodin comes in. <laughs> Talk to the doctor. <laughs> You mean that medicine wore off? How about taking it before you come for therapy? Give yourself an hour to absorb it a little bit. So sometimes we need to help people along, maybe modality. But that's one of the reasons I taught counter strain as the first half of the seminar. Get them a little more comfortable first, then they'll be amenable to stretching. They'll be ready instead of having those hyperactive spindle reflex operational. We're going to use a distinctly executed counter force, and that's typically for stretching. We do a lot of this contract, relax. You're familiar with contract, relax, PNF. Ask the person to contract the tight muscle, then you stretch them. So we're going to be very distinct about how we stretch them, when we stretch them, the direction, where we place our hands. And this is based on the same principles that we've already discussed in today's seminar, facilitation and inhibition through the neuromuscular system. Just to review, we know that muscles normally have a preset sensitivity to stretch. That's called the muscle spindle bias. Abnormal tension, traumas, diseases, change that muscle spindle bias. T technically, the muscle becomes more sensitive to stretch. People are telling you they feel like they're tight and they have a regular range of motion. I've worked prof with professional dancers. We also work with young and budding dancers. And I'll have a girl comes in, professional dancer, fell off the stage a couple of times. She has back problem, neck problem. She broke part of her foot, pulled her knee, and I could go on with the various problems. This girl could take her foot, wrap it around the back of her leg, and pick her nose with a big toe. Okay? Is she tight? No. She's hypermobile. Does she need to be hypermobile to be a dancer? Absolutely. Okay? But she feels tight because her muscle spindles are screaming that they're being stretched even when they're not. Because she fell off the stage a few times, her spindle reflexes are a little aberrant, <laughs> as you can imagine. And she ended up, her presentation was complex regional pain syndrome. Weird pains all over the place. They finally diagnosed her appropriately. And she did well. She went on to do a little bit of dancing, decided, I don't like to do this professionally, and became an OT. Go figure. I'm a PT. What a traitor, right? So, so our muscle responses, right? This is based on the change of length of our muscles. We want to make sure we restore a normal length, normal length tension relationship, normal biomechanics across the muscle, so we have good flexibility and good strength. We want to re-educate the muscle when we have a biomechanical dysfunction. And this is a principle we learned this morning, just in a schematic. If you're looking at muscles crossing a joint, say you have the flexors and extensors of the elbow, you have biceps and triceps. If the person's biceps is contracting and it's tight, won't it be sending a message into the spinal cord telling 
the triceps, time for you to take a break now. All right? You contract the agonist, naturally the antagonist must relax. That's reciprocal inhibition. So if you're looking to stretch a muscle, activate its antagonist. If you want to stretch that biceps contracture, make sure you activate the triceps. It'll help you. A technique of PNF muscle energy that has a new name, but they're doing the same thing. They just made a new name, right? Active isolated stretching. Aaron Mattis had created some of these techniques. It's essentially PNF using active contraction to help stretch muscles. And he adds a little overpressure and gave it a new name. So a lot of these things are stuff much of us are doing already. We're simply changing how we're doing it, changing the angle of application or the level of precision. But it's still muscle energy PNF work. You also remember that in the tendons you have Golgi tendon organs. If a muscle is tight, you can excite the Golgi tendon organ by applying some stretch, such as compression of the tendon. The Golgi tendon organ will inhibit the contraction. It does the opposite of the muscle spindle. So if you want to stretch a muscle, and you're fighting somebody who's so tense, perhaps they have spasticity, put direct pressure on the tendon, stimulate the Golgi tendon organ to inhibit the muscle, makes it relax a bit more so it's easier for you to stretch. We understand that this aberrant muscle behavior is a result of overload, generally into the spinal cord, too much excitation of that muscle spindle reflex. Contracts the muscle, tenses it up, and thereby also inhibits its antagonist, right? So muscles can be weak on both sides of the joint. Little hint, Dr. Vladimir Janda has done some teaching and studying in this area, and he discovered that muscles are basically of two types. You have fast twitch muscles and slow twitch muscles. Your fast twitch muscles are those phasic muscles. They don't use much oxygen. They contract very, very powerfully, but they don't last long. We would say they're the anaerobic muscles. Those are what we call our phasics. Postural muscles, the tonic muscles, are the ones holding us up all day. The postural tonics tend to be red muscle fibers, they're oxidative, they last a long time, but they do not contract with great force. They main, maintain contraction for a long duration of time, which is great because when we need to be held up all day, we want those postural tonics firing. Some examples of postural tonics. What's holding me up right now? Erectors, psoas, right? hamstrings, gastrox, okay? upper traps. Aren't these some muscles that many of us discovered have trigger points, tend to get tight? There's increased tone in the postural tonic muscles. They are more apt to become short and tight. And their antagonists, which are typically the phasic muscles, they tend to become inhibited and weak. So when we're addressing the body, consider what type of muscle am I working on? Our indications for muscle energy, muscle spasm, joint contracture, you're looking to increase range of motion. Muscles weak, you're looking for a strengthening effect. If you get muscles working more functionally, better contractility, you can actually get some edema reduction. Muscles help the lymphatics, pump the fluid back into the bloodstream. So much better to get those muscles working, get some edema reduction, and of course, joints will be moving better if the muscles around them are not tight and mobilize the joints. <clears throat> We'll use different types of contractions. Much of this will probably be review for you, but maybe you haven't seen the terminology in a while. Isometric contractions are when we hold the muscle still. And that's great because if you have an acute injury or someone in a lot of pain, you don't want to be doing a strong contraction through the range of motion. It tends to make people sore. So we start with a contraction where someone's just holding still, isometrically. Okay, joints not moving. That's done in the acute stage. Concentrics, shortening contractions. These are isotonics, approximating the origin and insertion of a muscle. This is typically pretty comfortable to do. It's done as exercise more in the subacute and chronic stages of an injury. Then in the more chronic, later subacute stages, we go into eccentric muscle contractions. These are lengthening contractions. Which ones tend to build up the muscle faster? Eccentrics, right? Which ones make people sore the most the next day? Eccentrics, so the lengthening contractions. How about isolytic? Has anyone ever heard of an isolytic contraction? Dr. Leon Chetau considers eccentric contractions to be isolytic in nature. If you think of just the root of the term lytic, it means to break down. Eccentric contractions actually do some microtrauma to the muscle, causing it to break down and thereby heal and build up faster so people get stronger. Do you ever want to do eccentrics in the acute stage? Not a great idea. Okay, because they make people sore, 
more chance of traumatizing the muscle, tearing the muscle. So you want to make sure that this goes from the acute through the chronic stages, pretty much in this sequence. Now, some met techniques have been broken down by Dr. Leon Chetow, who wrote the book Muscle Energy Therapy. I highly recommend the book, and it also comes with a little disc with some of the muscle energy techniques on it. Um, Dr. Chetow would say, in the acute stage, we're going to do some contract, relax muscle energy, contract, relax PNF. We want to get a post-isometric relaxation of the tight muscle, and we do it in this particular order. So we'll use an example. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Example, 22-year-old <clears throat> gentleman comes into my practice, status post, a fracture dislocation of the elbow on his dominant arm. He had the cast off the day before his first visit. He said, oh, he's whining away. I'll never play softball again. Doc said I won't get my motion back in my arm. Nobody ever gets their motion back in their arm. I said, nobody. Your doctor hasn't referred me enough patients yet. <laughs> we'll find a way. Let me see your x-ray. Maybe there's a reason he said you won't get your motion back. <coughs> x-ray was perfect. The alignment was perfect. There was no reason that he shouldn't get his motion back. But if you read many orthopedic textbooks, they tell you no forceful stretching of those elbow flexors. And it's also common after an injury to say the quads or the hamstrings. If you do forceful passive stretching, you might cause some trauma to the muscle and heterotopic ossification might occur. Calcium deposits may be deposited in the muscle, right? That's also called myositis ossificans. That's an excruciatingly painful condition and will probably require surgery. So we won't be forcefully stretching his elbow, but we'll do it gently, a little at a time. And we follow this basic MET technique. In the acute stage, he just got out of his cast yesterday. We want to resist him at his first barrier. I got to play softball again, and he just does this for fun, but he's just a craze for softball. This is as far as I could move. That's it. Oh, and it's really sore. So we're going to start working him to stretch the tight elbow flexors, biceps brachialis, caracobrachialis. Let's do some isometrics first. So I say, look, I want you to bend your elbow, and I'll resist you. Pull against me with about 20% of the force you think you can generate. Just nice, easy little contraction. Shouldn't hurt. He goes, oh, yeah, I could feel that. I resisted his first barrier. First barrier means actively what is the limit of his motion. The second barrier, I could push him a little past that, can't I? Okay, so Chetow's first barrier, the limit to his active motion, isometric contraction, hold it for about 10 seconds. Then as he relaxes, you can go ahead and stretch him. And you'll get some increased range of motion. There's a little window of time when stretching is much easier. After a muscle isometrically or concentrically contracts, there's a latency period. You might remember that from physiology as the refractory period. Okay? Latency period is measured on an EMG. There's about 15 to 30 seconds time within which a muscle can't contract strongly after it has just let go. So we utilize that. It gets the patient to fight us a little bit less, stretch them a little bit easier. And then we'll do three to five reps of this contract, relax, get this post-isometric relaxation work going. Follow it with the stretch. I don't count a number of seconds as far as how long do you hold the stretch? I go entirely by the feel with the patient. I hold the stretch till I feel that fascia releasing, softening, it starts to give, starts to increase in range of motion, take them to the new barrier, contract, relax again. Now, I'm a New Yorker, I tend to be in a hurry. Dr. Chetow says, you know, really hold this 20% intensity 20% of your maximum voluntary contraction, MVC, intensity, 7 to 10 seconds. Now, I give you a shortcut. I usually hold it for about 2 or 3. It's in the more acute stage. This guy's weak. His elbow's tired. He has a heck of a time holding for 10 seconds. However, you can actually rationalize. If you're just doing this for the post-isometric relaxation effect, 2 or 3 seconds, I find clinically works quite well. Little contraction. Doesn't wear him out. Doesn't make him sore. If you're looking for a strengthening effect, though, research shows you have to hold that isometric contraction about 10 seconds. So it's your call. If you're looking for strengthening at this point, he's new, just got out of a cast yesterday, I'm more interested in getting him motion. We could strengthen later. Does it make sense? So that's our acute stage. Now you can follow in the subacute and chronic stages. JTAO would say, well, chronic stage, position the patient at mid-range. So say it's two weeks later. And he can now bend his elbow some, and he's getting maybe minus 20 degrees of extension. So he's got a lot more motion. Chetow would say, put him at the mid-range, do your 
isometric contraction. Hold it for about 10 seconds, because now you might want to be working on some strengthening. And I do the same. And now you're working from 20 to 50% of your maximum voluntary contraction. Get a little more intensity into it. Start building some strength. Why was I told in PT school, use 100%? But why, when we think about it, with a clinical reasoning process, might it be better to use 20 to 50% contraction intensity? Think about what muscles get short and tight in the body, postural tonics or the fast twitch phasics? Postural tonics, right? Do tonic muscles function at 100% of intensity on a regular basis? No. So if you're thinking, I want to treat this patient functionally, I want to re-educate this muscle to contract in a functional way, meaning the way it would do in everyday life, postural tonics don't contract with much intensity. So we're really addressing that need there. I would recommend if you're dealing more with a fast twitch phasic muscle, okay, like the quads, maybe you want to use a little more contraction intensity. But always keep it within the tolerance of the patient. So you could reason it out that way. What kind of muscle is this? What kind of contraction does that muscle do on an ev everyday basis? And then match that for that person. We'll use the post-isometric relaxation effect, follow it with a stretch. Then I go to step two. I want some strength anywhere. Subacute or chronic now. We want to build up some strength. So to increase strength, I'm going to activate the antagonist of the tight muscle. Back to that elbow dislocation. Put them at mid-range. Contract. Hold it for 10 seconds. Get some strengthening. Stretch into the new range. I tend to go to end range as quickly as possible as long as the patient could tolerate it. Let them know. It might be a little sore to stretch, but let's work to your tolerance. And then do my contract. Relax again. After that, I'll find, I'll test the patient's arm. Hey, can you push your elbow into a straight position? And I'll find, oh, he's strong here at mid-range, but you get to the end range, what happens? It just dies out. He doesn't even feel that he's not there. Oh, that's as far as I go. No, come on, you could go farther than that. So I'll do repeated concentric contractions, starting from the part of the range he's strong, working to that range where he's not so strong. And to excite the muscle in that weak part of the range, that end range extension, what can you do? Can you get the muscle spindle reflex to help you? Monosynaptic reflex, quick stretch. Get him to the end of the range, a little quick stretch. Push, quick stretch, push, quick stretch, push. Or you can tap the muscle. Okay, if you're worried about irritating the joint with the quick stretch, if you think is a little bit too acute for that, you can just do some tapping. Come on, straighten out your arm. Straighten out your arm. Tap that muscle also to activate it. Okay, so isometrics. Types of contraction more commonly used in the acute stage, more commonly used for the spine. Spinal muscles tend to be more stabilizers. Okay? Isotonics are more commonly used functionally for the extremities. Extremities spend a lot of time moving around while the spine is holding us stable. Okay? Remember to follow with the repeated concentric working up to eccentric contractions. Precautions. Don't overdo it. You are not the bone crusher. Okay? Keep precise control of the joint position. Don't allow compensation by the patient. The patient comes in with a frozen shoulder, can't lift my arm. What do you see? Massive scapular elevation. So you mobilize them, maybe you do your soft tissue work, whatever you do, and you find you can passively bring them up yourself. But when he goes to abduct, what happens? You still see that compensatory pattern. So this is when I get the person in the mirror, Look at what you're doing as you lift your arm, push your shoulder down, and I show him how to do that hands-on. So it's critical to stop the compensation. Don't just throw the patients in the gym. Here, do your exercise, and they're not doing it with precision. You're retraining the wrong muscles. And if you're consistently doing scapula elevation, you will create a neck problem. Might even end up with a pinched nerve, brachial plexus problem, thoracic outlet, something to be careful about. Specific direction of force is used. Where you place your hand on the body is going to tell the person where to move. And I see this all the time in the clinic. I've done quite a bit of clinical affiliation, site visits, looking at our PT students going to hospitals, clinics, schools, nursing homes, and I watch what goes on. It's scary out there. <laughs> okay? Who's sitting there in their wheelchair with that little weight on their ankle for like an hour and no one came back to check her out? Right? I come down the hall, the same ladies there as when I walked in before lunch hour. So we have to be a little careful about mindful of our patients, watching what they're doing, how they're doing it. Very important. Specific direction of force. If I want shoulder abduction and I want to resist him, but I have my hand in front of the body, which way is he moving his arm? 
Yeah, that's the feedback I gave. If I want abduction, I have to put the hand on the side. If I wrap my whole hand around him, what does he think? Confused, where do I go now? So the handling techniques. I see too many people grabbing joints. Joints have synovial linings. They don't like to be squished. You ever been a patient on the table? <laughs> okay, you've realized this. I've had more therapists like leaning on my wrist while they worked on me or yanking on something. No concept of where to hold. Your counterforce is also very distinct. Once you've done some isometric resistance and you're going to give a counterforce to stretch him, make sure he let go and relaxed before you start pulling, right? How many patients take a moment or two before they can let go? They don't even realize they're still holding. So don't start that eccentric contraction. You'll tear the muscle. They become very uncomfortable. Just not a good thing. So our techniques, of course, examine the patient, identify what the problems are. Is there limited range of motion? We need, of course, stretching muscle energy. Is there weakness? Of course, you need strengthening muscle energy. Is there a joint dysfunction? They have a joint that's stuck in flexion. Well, we need to get it moving into extension. So it's really a matter of being very specific. Problem solved. Decide what your goal is. Generally, I like to get mobility first, get the range of motion back, and then start working on the strengthening. This way, they could do a little bit more on their own. We'll use some examples of stiff shoulder, shoulder elevation, flexion, abduction. We'll also throw in a little rotation, and you'll be mindful of my hand positions as I demonstrate for you. Then we'll go into doing some stretching. Many people with tight hamstrings, right? Who hasn't done a hamstring stretch like this? We'll add, though, when you're stretching the hamstrings. Many people think, oh, we're just stretching the knee. Well, what about the hip? What about the ankle? Don't muscles cross those joints in two or threes? Not necessarily single joint, but double joint muscles, multi-joint muscles. So we're going to isolate joints, and then we're going to see, can we stretch over many joints at a time? And we'll use our contract relax for that. I see too many patients who have knee flexion contractures, especially after knee surgery. And they've already been to physical therapy. They come to me later. Oh, it's still stuck. No one paid attention to the gastroc. What gets tight behind the knee? Hamstrings? What else? Gastroc. So you can't leave it out. So we get this ankle dorsiflexion during the straight leg raise. That gets a rip roaring stretch. Imagine the person, however, just a consideration, herniated lumbar disc with pain down the back of the leg. You start doing a straight leg raise to stretch the hamstring. What happens? He's not happy. <laughs> pain down the back of the leg. My foot's going numb. Of course, that would be a contraindication. So if stretching is contraindicated for some reason, such as herniated disc, recent surgery, doc doesn't want him stretched until the tendon's repaired kind of thing. Of course, you are going to modify for each of those situations. So we'll talk about our hand positions. Then we'll get into those tight hip flexors. I know they're out there. I've seen a few today, OK? So we need to stretch them. Hip flexors, make a note in your book. Iliopsoas muscle. Psoas in particular, I already mentioned, originates on the lumbar vertebral bodies and the intervertebral discs, which are made out of cartilage. If someone has disc damage or degeneration, and you do a very, very strong contraction or a sudden strong stretch of the psoas, you might tear a disc. I have had patients in whose physical therapist tore out their discs, had lumbar surgery. So we're going to be extremely gentle when we recognize, oh, that muscle doesn't just attach to a bone, it attaches to discs. And if someone has a back problem, we must be extremely gentle when doing this. And you could do that with them hanging off the table in a Thomas test position. You could do that in prone. You could do it in sideline. So just like we did with positional release, you could use different body positions based on the needs of the patient. We're going to do some shoulder stretching. Check first to see, does your partner, does your patient have a normal range of motion? So Eddie, just bring your arm overhead. Does he get 180 degrees of flexion? Yes. Let's pretend he only got this far. Let's pretend he has a frozen shoulder. A nice way to grasp would be distal humerus, 
And what's going to substitute and start elevating if his glenohumeral joint is stiff? Scapula, right? You'll feel that acromion jumping up. So I like to either stabilize at the acromion, the top of the shoulder, while I'm stretching, holding the distal humerus, or you could also stabilize the lateral border of the scapula. Either way, the acromion is the scapula too. And I'll do some contract, relax, post-isometric relaxation first with the stretch. Now, Eddie, what I'm going to do, make believe it's a little sore when you get up here. So, oh, that hurts there. Yeah, so he's getting stiff. Tell the patient where he should feel. He should feel the stretch down here in the teres major, in the lats. Those are the extensors. They limit flexion. Teres major, lats, long head of the tricep. But where will the person with the frozen shoulder complain about pain? Deltoid. Is that stretching? No, it's actually bunching up. It's actually counter strain. That's impingement. That means the humeral head is bumping into the acromion, crushing the supraspinatus tendon. Okay? Not a good deal. What can you do to separate humeral head and acromion? Traction. So if I cradle the arm, you just want to see how I'm holding arm between my arm and waist. Easy. Grip the distal humerus, stabilize the scapula, and get a little traction. If I just lean my body weight back, I get some traction. Feel some stretch? Mm -hmm. Comfortable? Yeah. Patients will not be comfortable. No. Warn them. He has been a patient. He knows. No, I'm not comfortable. And we'll do some contract relax. And I want you to push your arm up toward the ceiling. Ready? Go ahead. Push lightly. One, two, three. Relax. Now you'll feel me stretching you some. How are you doing? Yeah, I feel it pulling. It's uncomfortable. Can you deal with it? Yeah. OK, suck it up. Let's go. <laughs> Whatever he can do. If his eyeballs are bulging out of his head, naturally, I'm backing off. OK, push up to the ceiling again with your arm. One, two, three, relax. Nice and easy. And my grip is really between my elbow and my waist. I'm just stabilizing and resisting his humerus from here, making sure that scap doesn't jump up. And gradually, you come up in range of motion. If abduction is limited, you want to glide the arm on the table. And you're just going overhead like this, like a jumping jack, OK? And say he got to here. That's his limitation. So he's about 120 degrees. And you notice his shoulder's shrugging up. Ah, oh, he's cheating. Drop him down a little bit to where that shoulder's not shrugging so much. Get that acromion planted, stabilized. Traction the distal humerus. And then work into abduction. And I go, oh, that's enough right there. Good, we're getting a good stretch. Let me add a little bit more traction so we're not impinging. Now, pull your elbow toward your waist lightly. One, two, three. Good, and relax. Wait for him to let go. Up we come. How are you doing with that? Better. Better. OK. Pull down again. One, two, three, and relax. Nice and easy. Wait for him to let go. Good idea to have him breathing. Breathing is always good, right? And you're contracting, relaxing as you go. For rotation. Now, mind you, as far as my position, I generally sit next to the patient in a chair. But because of the camera, I'm staying to the side just to be out of the way. It's a lot easier to sit next to them. Lateral rotation should be 90 degrees. Actually, Eddie's just slightly stiff here. He's getting about 85. You OK with that? Medial rotation should be 70 degrees. If someone is cheating, you will see the humeral head anteriorly gliding. You see the whole shoulder pop forward. That's cheating. Keep that shoulder down, level with the table, and then hold the distal radius. This way you have the shoulder stabilized. If he's not internally rotating, what muscles are tight? The lateral rotators, right? External rotators. What muscles are the external rotators that are tight that he might feel stretching? Posterior deltoid, infraspinatus, teres minor. So those are back here. They should be stretching. He might feel stretching around the shoulder. So Eddie, I'm going to have you push your hand back like this when I say go. Ready? Mm -hmm. Push back gently. Hold it. One, two, three. Relax. Now after you relax, I'm going to let you stretch. OK, so he gets a little bit farther. Contract, relax again. Push back gently. Go ahead. Go. One, two, three. Relax. And down he goes. Now what people will do to cheat, he'll start extending his elbow. So keep that, that elbow at 90 degrees. If it's too much for his shoulder to be at 90 degrees, I'll actually abduct him a little less. Keep it tolerable. And especially for internal rotation, there's a great chance for impingement. 
So that's a good time to cradle his arm, do the traction, and then you can internally rotate him from there. Okay, and he could just go up against gravity. Just push your hand back toward my face a little bit and relax. So just gravity could be the resistance. You don't need a lot of resistance for this to work. Okay, lateral rotation is limited. We usually like to get him at 90 degrees. Too painful, go a little lower. Eddie, we're going to go back here. Say he's limited right here. External rotation is limited. What's tight? Internal rotators. Subscapularis, pec major, anterior deltoid, teres major, right? I want you to pull your hand this way when I say go, okay? And then we'll do a little stretch. Give me a little pull, tiny. One, two, three, relax. Good. And then just let this stretch. And again, that humeral head may be pulling forward. Might even be going back. Chromium might be elevating, so stabilize him. Okay, pull forward again into my hand. One, two, three, relax, and so on. So you could get some nice post isometric relaxation stretch. And once you've done that and you have a better range of motion, you want to start working into strengthening. So when you get that person with that rotator cuff problem, and he started with, oh, I can only move this far. So he gets maybe. 40, 45 degrees of lateral rotation. I get him past that. Maybe I get him to 75 degrees today. So he had a 30 degree increase in motion. Is he going to have any strength going back like that? No. So now I want to strengthen. Eddie, we're going to start working your muscles. You ready? I'm going to ask you to push back till you can't push anymore. And at that point, I'm going to help you stretch and move you along, OK? OK, ready? Push back into my hand. Now what's going to happen? Just push hard so they can see. That elbow starts dropping down. He starts extending his arm. Does all this cheating. So you need to stabilize that. I tend to hold the distal humerus at that point. Resist at the distal radius. Go ahead, push back. So you get a cleaner contraction. Keep going and say right there he peters out. He gets really weak. Relax. Now push back. I'll have him do some isometrics at that weak part of the range. Hold it for 10 seconds. Relax. Have him do a couple reps. Then go through the whole motion again. Go ahead, push back. Keep going. So now he'll be stronger in that part of the range. And right where he poops out, I'm going to help him. Keep pushing back. I'm helping you. I'm helping you. So you resist where he's strong. You assist where he's weak and stiff. Does this make sense? Give him a chance to start building up. OK, and we'll follow with repeated concentric contractions of those weak muscles. Now we're going to do some hamstring stretching. So we'll check the length of the hamstrings. OK, straight leg raise with the knee straight. Come on, we're getting a little tight about here. OK, he's getting a little smile on because he feels something going on. He should be able to come up a good 80 or 90 degrees, correct? He'd like to get up a little bit more. So check the hamstring length, straight leg raise. One of the biggest issues I see therapists do is they crush the patient's kneecap. <laughs> Not nice, especially if they have patellofemoral problems you can wear out the cartilage under there and cause trouble. So make sure your hand is above the patella. Push that quad down, push that knee into extension, because if you don't, you end up getting this type of leg raise, and you wonder, why does that patient still have terminal extension leg? Why do they have a knee flexion contraction? Because we forgot to get the knee straight. Now, I have a barrier here, and that's where I want to start doing my contract relax. It's easier if I just balance his leg on my shoulder. I could use two hands to hold the knee into extension. Now push your whole leg down on my shoulder. Give me a nice little push gently. One, hold it. Two, hold it. Three, hold it and relax. Now as he relaxes, we sneak up a little bit more. Do you feel that pulling behind your leg? Are we happy about it? No. No. <laughs> okay. Will we still pay our copayment at the end of the day? Yes. Yes. Anything while I'm holding his leg, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, push down again. And relax. Is it tolerable, though? Uh -huh. So breathe. He doesn't sound convinced. Mm-hmm. You know? Have him breathing to work through it. That'll help him to relax a little more. Push down again. Hold it. One, two, three. Relax. You're doing great. And coming up. Now, push down. I'm noticing once he's up higher, his quads are not getting that nice, solid contraction he had when he was lower. So I want to get those quads to work, too. Relax. 
Now, next time you push, push down, tap the muscle, push down, tighten right here. Feel these muscles right here. Push, feel that kneecap tightening. Push, 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 push hard. So if you want to get some quads activation in the terminal range, you need to get a little tapping, help him along. Feel the contraction under your hands so you know he has it. And relax. Feel the difference with that? You okay? And push down again. But really tighten up that kneecap. Yes, yeah, solid in the quads. Good, good, excellent. And relax. And so on. Now you can start adding the gastroc stretch. The first stretch when we did not include the ankle is really just getting mostly the hamstring. Biceps, semimembranosus, semitendinosus, they cross the hip and the knee. The gastrocnemius, the calf muscle, plantar flexor, crosses from the posterior femoral condyles down to the calcaneus. So to stretch it, I like to check the dorsiflexion range of motion at his ankle. Grasp the calcaneus, have the ball of his foot against your forearm, and you can get a nice little stretch. Feel that pull going up the back of your leg? Comfortable? Tolerable. You Tolerable. <laughs> OK, so it's a good stretch. So you want to get that at least 20 degrees of dorsiflexion. Now I'll sneak up, start adding a straight leg raise, and we'll start to stretch the gastroc where it crosses the knee as well as the ankle. Tell me if it's too much. He doesn't have quite as happy a face on at this time, but he's being a good sport. Now, where would I do my contract relax? Push the ball of the foot down on my arm like you're pumping a gas pedal. Perfect. Push, hold it. One, two, three, relax. Good. And more stretch. Now, he could do two at once. Push your toes against my arm, push down the gas pedal. At the same time, push your leg down to the table. Down that way. Good. Tighten. Hold it. One, two, three, and relax. Good. How are we doing there? Good. Nice work. OK. So let's do the straight leg raise test again and see how the motion is. So ankle and knee. Straight. Any better? And for you, Eddie? Mm -hmm. OK. Now, take a look at the other leg on the other side. As he comes up here, what's happening there? Yeah. If you start to see that other leg coming up, you have to keep it down. His hip flexors might be tight on that side, which leads us into the hip flexor stretch momentarily. Let me show you one other stretch for the ankle that's very, very helpful where I don't have to use my hands. She would cheat like crazy. She would abduct her leg and externally rotate instead of dorsiflexing. That's one of the most common substitutions. So I want to make sure I stop the substitution first, and then I start stretching. So get the person in prone. Palpate the sinus tarsi. You'll feel a space anterior inferior to the medial and lateral malleolus. It feels like a space under the bone. You can feel the talus there. As you start dorsiflexing the foot, getting the foot closer to neutral, as close as you could get, mind you, she didn't quite get all the way there, I got her into subtalar neutral, meaning the foot's in the middle where it belongs. Now I could stretch it. I'll get my thigh under her foot, hold her ankle steady with my hand right around that fracture site, palpating, stabilizing, and just as I lean my foot forward, lean my thigh forward, you get some dorsiflexion action. Feel a little pull starting up here at all? OK. Let them know they should feel the pull in a certain area. Now push your toes down on me. Push the ball of your foot easy. One, two, three, relax. And keep that subtalar neutral. Keep that foot neutral relative to inversion, eversion. Good. Feel the stretch? Push down again gently. One, two, three. Excellent. And relax. And as I just lean my body weight forward, this is no work for me. So it's very nice to save your hands, use your thigh. I'm just using them to stabilize him, to stabilize the ankle. Push down. One, two, three, relax. Now, having the pillow underneath the ankle gives his knee a little bit of knee flexion. That means I'm working more the deep muscle of the calf, the soleus. That originates below the knee, OK? Posterior fibula, interosseous membrane, Okay, tib posterior tibia, and also comes down to the Achilles. So in order to get more of the gastroc, which is usually the culprit of lack of terminal knee extension, I'm going to take the pillow out. You could keep it for that foot. 
I would actually put a pad, like a towel roll or something, under his knee, get a little hyperextension there, and then go ahead and do the same stretch. Feel how this is a little different? Where do you feel it? Up Going up higher. Okay, so you get more of the gastroc where it starts from above the knee, posterior femoral condyles. Push down again. Good, and relax. So just another way to get some dorsiflexion, which is rather challenging sometimes for people. We're going to do the Thomas test for hip flexion contractures. This knee should be fully flexed. Hip flexed, knee flexed. Now, is his leg flat on the table? No, I could fit two fingers under there. In the clinic, you would use a goniometer, of course, and measure, you know, is he 10, 20 degrees off the table? You should be flat on the table in a normal test. Okay? And what else is happening? Let's take a look down at his foot. Is gravity working today? No, planet was on a holiday, right? Gravity took off. His foot's floating out in the air. If gravity was working, where would this be? There. But what move to compensate? Okay, in order to flex his knee, he has to flex his hip. The hip flexors, we already mentioned iliopsoas, iliacus and psoas. Psoas comes off the lumbar vertebrae and the discs, goes down medial to ASIS, wraps around the groin to the lesser trochanter. Iliacus, internal iliac fossa, medial to ASIS, wraps around the groin to the lesser trochanter. Presenting complaint might be groin pain. Oh, I pulled a groin muscle. Now, oh, you know, my back is all arched. I can't get out of it. Or my back is killing me, and they're all crooked. So it's classic psoas spasm. So we want to stretch the hip flexors first. I might use my body to keep the one leg up if he gets tired of holding it. I can stabilize. Just let your foot rest on me. I can stabilize the ilium here at the ASIS. Resist gently hip flexion. And the key is gently. If you resist too strong the hip flexors, you might start pulling on those intervertebral discs. And if they're already damaged or a little weak, could be a problem. So please do not use a strong contraction. To let him know that he won't use a strong contraction, I'm going to say, Eddie, pull this knee up toward my nose gently. Tiny little finger pressure. And relax. Feel that pull in your hip when you do that? Now I'm going to stretch a little bit. Let me know if that's OK. So some passive hip extension. He's got an end point here. I'm going to wait. Let him stretch. And breathe. You feel that pulling through the front? Good. Little tiny pull up. Tiny. One, two, three, relax. On some patients, if you fail to keep the other knee up toward the chest, they'll start to arch their back. They'll start to get an anterior pelvic tilt. Okay, tight psoas will do that. So keeping the opposite side bent up is very, very helpful. And little tiny push-up. Excellent. And relax. And breathe. Good job. Oh, and did we get down to the table yet? Yeah, do you feel the table on the back of your leg? Mm -hmm. Little pull up, itty bitty. And relax. Now, I'm going to let this go a little bit. And we're going to go ahead and stretch the rectus femoris. So can you keep this up? Do you need a rest? No, I got it. You're good? To get the rectus femoris, that's going to be from the anterior inferior iliac spine. Comes down over the thigh, the superficial quad, into the kneecap, and ultimately the tibial tubercle. So it's a quadriceps. It extends the knee. That's why his foot is up in the air. And of course, it flexes the hip. So we got the hip flexor part. Here's where we're going to come. You're going to feel more stretch coming now, so let me know if this is OK with you. Ready? Feel the front of the thigh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He feels it. Are you OK with that? Good. Now, feel my finger touching the front of your shin here? Give me a tiny little kick forward. Tiny one. Hold it. Two. Hold it. Three. Hold it. Relax. Nice and easy. Feel that thigh stretching? Yep. yep. <laughs> Voice is getting just a little higher <laughs> for such a lovely gentleman. OK, little tiny kick now. Good. And relax. Now, no, I, I'm like barely pushing him here. If I went like gangbusters here, it's going to be strong. So I just want to give him a little feedback. He knows it's nice and light. Are you OK with this? All right. What happens to, and he's getting a little bit of this, many people are tight in their abductors. Iliotibial band might be tight, tensor fascia lata, glute medius, glute maximus will tend to cause the leg to be abducting. So what do I want to do to correct that? Abduct him while he's flexing. Feel how that's a little different? OK, 
Okay, so have the patient show you where he feels it. So you know, yes, you should be feeling it there. Thank you very much. That means I'm doing the right thing. To work those abductors, how could I do some contract relax for him? Where would he push now? Abduct. So feel my fingers here on your thigh. Push out into my fingers lightly. Oh, lightly. That's too much. And relax. A few ounces is fine. Good. Feel it stretch a little bit? You okay? Doing great. One more. So I do three to five reps in each direction and relax. We're taking a little longer because, of course, I'm explaining the whole thing to you. But it goes pretty quickly with the patient. I'm going to let you go nice and easy. Let's just come out of it nice and easy. Keep this guy up. Can you test this one and let it drop again, see what happens? OK, is the leg on the table? And what about the foot? A little bit more knee flexion. OK, that's great. Let me just try a different position. In prone, what's different with the other hip? Say I'm stretching one side. The other side is hyperextended. That could cause a problem where? Low back. So if he can tolerate the dual extension of both hips, fine. But you could get a nice little stretch for the quads with the knee flexion, add the hip flexors, stabilize his back so it doesn't start popping up off the table. I like to hold at the ilium and sacrum and start to get some stretch this way, cradle his leg. You OK with that one? Face the audience. Lay on your side. Bend your bottom knee up toward your chest. Just comfy. That will keep him from rolling off the table. You could do the stretch. With contract relax, I tend to hold his hip in place with my hip. We'll get some hip extension. And yes, this is the opposite leg. Feel how that's pulling? And you could do a little bit, pull your knee forward, a little bit, and relax. So the same thing, knee flexion, hip extension, stabilize his hip. I could use my own hip to do that easily. OK, just to give you some concepts to work with. Having the opposite hip and knee bent protects the back, so the people complaining about their backache will be far happier. Or if they have dual hip flexion contractors on both sides, side lying's easiest. Sometimes they'll have the leg hanging off the table in supine with one knee up. Just another concept. So many ways to skin a cat. So here we're imagining that the patient is stiff. We're going to make believe that he can't turn to the right very well. <clears throat> Say he only goes this far. Now, do you want to be on the road with Eddie driving if he can't look over his right shoulder? Not safe. So this is functional stuff. This relates to being safe and doing things in everyday life. If he can't rotate to the right passively, and here's the kick, he might be able to have me do it actively. Myself. He's passive. I'm doing the work. The tightness means he can't rotate passively with me doing the work. That's the restriction. Restricted passive range of motion. You can measure it with a goniometer. So pretend he goes from like 0 to 20 degrees and no more. He can't rotate to the right. What muscles are tight? His left rotators. What muscles are the left rotators? The right sternocleidomastoid, the right upper trapezius, the right scalenes. The other muscles that could be tight are the left erectors, some of the left suboccipitals. Okay? Those are all those muscles, splenius. So he might feel the pull on either side of his neck, depending upon which muscles are tight. So I'll let him know, well, when I start stretching you, turning your head, you let me know when you feel it. You're going to turn your head as far as you can. Oh, you're getting stuck right there. Feel stiff. I'm going to resist the tight muscles, the left rotator. So I'll place a hand over the left side of the head. Usually I use like frontal parietal. Turn your head to the left a little bit. Hold it gently, gently, one, two, three, and relax. I have one hand under the occiput, so I have a little force counter force between my hands, and I turn him a little more to the right. Good. Oh, he's feeling stiff there again. Maybe he's complaining. Yes, it's really pulling. Good. Turn left again. Look left while you're turning left. Look with your eyes. See who's coming. Good. And relax. And I'm going to turn you a little bit more. So as you turn him more and more, he gets greater right rotation. Another example. <clears throat> Say the patient has pain when he contracts his neck muscles. So I'm going to turn him, and I'll just show you a different hand position. I could cup his occiput with one hand, 
hold the lateral side, left side of his head with the other, so I get nice movement. Turn right. Say that's his limitation. I want him to do some resisted left rotation. Turn your head to the left. Ow, it hurts. Oh, I don't like doing that. Relax. What else can I use? Eye muscle energy. Just using the eyes will turn on the same left neck rotators, and it won't harm the neck muscles. So this time, Eddie, just look to the left with your eyes. Don't worry about moving your muscles. Just look, 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 and relax. Now I'm going to turn you more, and we'll get a little stretch. Oh, I could really feel it pulling there. Good. Look left again. Keep looking for three seconds. Good. And relax. And as he looks to the left, I can feel his neck muscles contract a little bit, very lightly. Now we stretch. Look to the left again, and so on. So three to five reps, followed by a stretch. Now if I want him to get some of that movement now on his own, what could I use for eye muscle energy to help him turn right? Looking to the right. Now look to the right, turn right. Look right, turn. Look, look to the right, keep looking. Look and turn right. Keep looking while you're turning. Good, say he gets stuck right there. Okay, look left, turn left. Hold it, one, two, three, relax. Now I'll help you where you're stiff, okay? We're gonna go right through the stiffness. Look right, turn right. Look right, turn right. Good, look right, turn right. Beautiful. Okay, getting too stiff there, we'll stop. Contract, relax again. Look to the left now. Look left, turn left. So as long as he can do the two together, go for it. If he can't, just use the eyes and relax. And we take him through the motion. If you see compensation like he's flexing into rotation or extending, get him back into neutral. So you could basically work with that flexion extension, work neutral first. Let's say he's limited in lateral flexion. Lateral flexion left. Measure. Okay, Eddie actually has good motion, but if he were a real patient, of course, you can imagine that he'd be getting stiff. So we measure and see what is his passive motion like. Let's say he's limited here. He tilts a little bit to the left. He's saying, wow, it's really pulling on the right side. What should be pulling when he's side bending to the left? Upper traps, scalenes, sternocleidomastoid, splenius, levator, erectors, all the stuff on the right. I could very gently hold the base of his skull, tilt him to the left, and what might be jumping up if he's really tight? Shoulder. If the traps and levator are tight, you'll see that shoulder elevating. You could just use your other hand. Just keep that shoulder down now. And I feel the stretch on the right side. Oh, yeah, I feel those muscles really pulling. Good. Contract, relax could be either from the neck, lateral flexors, or from the shoulder. It's easier from the shoulder. Feel that pull on the right side? Mm -hmm. Very gently shrug this shoulder up. Nice and easy. Good. And relax. Most patients shrug really hard. So tell them really easy, and you'll feel a stretch. How's that? Good. Good. And pull up a little bit. Good. And relax. Excellent. I could have also held the base of his occiput. If he was having some impingement or pain on the left side, I could traction from the occiput, open up the facet joints, and still get that nice scapular depression to stretch all of those muscles. Shoulder up a little bit, pull. Good, and relax. Or I could have worked from his head very lightly. Tilt your right ear toward your shoulder. Go ahead. And relax. And he's tending to rotate instead of tilting. So you're going to tilt this way. Show him if he doesn't get it. Okay, tilt to the right. Good, easy. One, two, three, relax. And then stretch. So very easy to do the contract, relax for the neck to increase range of motion. Next step, strengthening. You want to stabilize him. He's going back to the wrestling team. He might be in some crazy position where he's upside down on his head and someone has him in a headlock. His neck better be strong so he could tolerate that. So this is where you're going to do initially isometrics through the weak range of motion. Now he could turn right, but he hasn't done so for a while since he got the whiplash. So you turn right, multiple angle isometrics against resistance. Turn your head to the right. Give me a nice push. Give me like 20% to half of what you can push with comfortably. Good. 10 seconds hold and relax. Five reps at each angle. Go about another 15, 20 degrees. Turn right. Feel the resistance. Good. Feel your muscles working. Good. 10 second hold and relax. 
I'm not holding 10 seconds in the interest of brevity here, but for patients, isometrics need to be 10 seconds based on research and through multiple angles, usually about every 15 degrees. Turn right, hold it, and I have a force on the right side of his head and the back side of his occiput. And relax. So then you could go from isometrics to isotonics. You're going to turn to the right, and I'm going to resist you. So push me, turn right. Push me, push me, keep going, keep going. Here I match his resistance. Make sure he's comfortable. Keep going, keep going, and relax. And I may do a few reps, a couple sets of five, a couple sets of ten, whatever needs to build him up. And you can do that for side bending, rotation, flexion, extension. Okay. Now we're going to work on someone who has restricted spinal lateral flexion. Commonly, patients present to you, and they have one side of their back is really aggravated and tight. Maybe they lifted a box by twisting and lifting, of course, the wrong way. Bending and twisting is one of the most common mechanisms for spinal injury to the low back. Muscle injury, disc damage. You want to make sure people don't flex, bend, and twist, especially when lifting a load. So they might have pulled out quadratus lumborum, lower lumbar erector spinal muscles, and they become in a spasm. You might see that person tends to be side bent to one side if they're really tight. And if they're tight on the right, what motion would be limited? Side bending to the left. So we'll just use as an example the left quadratus lumborum. So let's have you lay on your right side facing the front of the room. So if the left QL is tight, you may recall that the quadratus lumborum is the most lateral muscle, just lateral to the erectors. It comes from the lower ribs and transverse process of L5, sometimes L4, comes down diagonally to the iliac crest. It's a short muscle. It is a spinal extensor and a lateral flexor. It also, if the back is held still, can elevate the ilium on that side. We would say hip hiking or elevating the pelvis. This muscle is very active to help us standing with our standing balance, especially when we're walking. So it tends to become very much in a contracture with people with chronic back pain, where people do a great deal of lifting, bending, twisting activity. Um, I also see it commonly in long distance runners, and the constant pounding and absorbing that impact. So quadratus lumborum is most easy to palpate. If you palpate the iliac crest, come into the narrowest part of the waist, push medial inferior, you'll feel the iliac crest come around. And it's pretty soft by the abdominals, and then as you come into the QL, you'll feel a little taut band right in there. Sometimes people will jump because they often have a hot active trigger point in that area. So I can ask, oh, how much does that hurt when I poked at this point? And say, he says, oh, gee, that's an eight. That's really sore. I didn't know that was so sore in there. What would we do first if we tried to stretch this on range of motion testing, and he complained, that hurts to stretch. Do I want to jump into that muscle with muscle energy stretching? He hurts. What could we do first? Positional release, strain, counter strain. How could we positional release this hip hiker extensor lateral flexor? Hip hike them, extend them, laterally flex them. So we'll use a few pillows for that. In the clinic, you should have pillows and bolsters. So I could take a few pillows. And Eddie, I'm going to ask you to put a bunch of pillows under your shoulder. Just sit up a little bit for me. We're going to put a whole bunch under there. OK? And just rest on those. And you see that I already have him laterally flexed a bit to the left. If you wanted him laterally flexed, more and more pillows. In my office, I have tables that bend and move mechanically, so I could just bend up the feet of the table to side bend him. Or you could put some pillows under his legs to side bend him. To get more counter strain, again, we're first looking to release the trigger point that we have in here. I can ask him, bend up your knees. Good. To get him to have a little bit of extension, just tip your shoulder back a little. You could let your elbow bend. Just tip that shoulder back. Can you see that he could extend back against that muscle just by tipping back on one side? Check again, how did that work for the trigger point? Oh, it's better, but it's not gone. It's down to a two, but I still feel it. Lastly, I could do passive hip hiking. And that would be from the ischial tuberosity, I push right up through the ilium. That's most easy to do from the other side of the table. I would block your vision. So I'm going to go ahead and do it from this side. OK to push up on your bottom here? If I could easily hip hike him, I'm more apt to use my forearm. It's much easier to get in there for my body mechanics, and it saves your hand. And I could feel that soften as I do that. 
Hold that positional release for the 90 seconds. Take him out of it. Just relax there. Now he should be less sensitive. Oh, feels much better. Good, let's stretch it. Now you're ready for stretch. We've calmed down the muscle spindle. To stretch it, I need you to sit up for a minute. And we're going to give you a nice stretch to this side of the back by leaning you over a tower of pillows. How does that sound? Okay. So I need you to kind of boost yourself up on those pillows. Good. Legs up. So he could side bend over the pillows. See how he goes into a little more of a stretch? I could add some stretch to that area. Feel some pulling in here now? Yeah. OK. And this is where we could do the contract, relax muscle energy. Hike the hip up against some resistance. Have my hand in the iliac crest, the other stabilizing the ribs. Feel my hand here pushing you down. Mm -hmm. Pull back up against me, lightly. Good. Make sure he's contracting the right muscles. You could feel him elevating his ilium and relax. Feel the stretch. Mm -hmm. Hike up again and relax. Feel the stretch. To get more stretch, we can put this leg down. Bring this arm up overhead. Can you see how that would open up that area more? And it may be helpful from your perspective to get two hands in the iliac crest. Some people are really tight here. I want my body weight behind me. I have one foot in front of another, so I'm in like a lunge position. Use your body weight and drop that ilium down, just leaning in. Feel the difference in the stretch now? Mm -hmm. Pull up. Good, and relax. Nice and easy. Perfect. And then again, three to five reps, contract, relax on that side. Come back. And then you would check him in standing. What is his lateral flexion like? You should be able to measure increased degrees of lateral flexion. Or easy way to measure lateral flexion from his fingertip to the floor. As his hand slides down his legs, you can measure from his fingertip to the floor. How many inches is he from the floor? Should become usually an inch or two closer after a good stretch of the QL. Okay, thank you. Come on and sit. Somatic dysfunction. That means the joint is out of alignment. If the joint is out of alignment, you'll see postural asymmetry, bony landmarks will be uneven side to side, and a perfect example of this where you can go ahead and use muscle energy to try to correct it would be correction of a pelvic torsion or a pelvic rotation. If someone is anterior, the pelvis is actually rotating forward on that side. That means they're rotating which way on the other side? Backward. So if I say to you, my patient has a right anterior rotation of the anominate, the ilium, that means he also has a left posterior. So always reference, I reference just for my notes one side. It's implied that the other side will be out of balance as well. And it's easy to remember. In this slide, we see that the abnormal position that patients may present with could be an anterior rotation, say, on the right. I happen to see more common anterior rotations on the right side. So I have drawn some gorgeous artwork for you, and you will very quickly understand why I did not go into graphic design, okay, or anatomical illustration. Let us imagine that this is a right ilium. In the ilium, if you're looking from a lateral perspective at the right ilium, you have the iliac crest, you have the anterior surface with the ASIS. You have the posterior surface with the PSIS. You recognize these bony landmarks. Of course, most of you are sitting on your ischial tuberosities right now, and thereby we know where we are. In normal standing posture, ASIS and PSIS should be equidistant from the floor. They should be level. In cases where people have a pelvic rotation, if there is an anterior pelvic rotation, what sticks out? Their bottom, right? Very elegant. Extra lumbar lordosis, anterior pelvic tilt. What muscles are tight that could be contributing to that anterior pelvic tilt? Hip flexors, correct? They attach to the anterior superior iliac spine and anterior inferior iliac spine. In particular, rectus femoris comes down below the ASIS. We know the psoas and iliac is a little bit above. So that can pull that pelvis anteriorly anterior rotation. Imagine it's almost like a clockwise turn here with this arrow. What muscles could pull the pelvis into a posterior pelvic tilt or a posterior rotation? Hamstrings. They attach to the ischial tuberosity 
and they're in a force vector to posteriorly rotate or counterclockwise in this illustration, the pelvis. So we can use the energy of these muscles, muscle energy, to actually change the position of the pelvis. Let us imagine that our model here has an anterior rotation on the right. This hip flexor is tight on the right. What's tight on the left? Hamstrings. Interesting. Our model actually had tight hamstrings on the left after his ACL. And I noticed that he's a little tight on the right side. And he mentioned he has a tendency to go out of balance. He's not grossly out of balance today. But we'll look at one thing. You will notice a little bit of lateral rotation that is typical on the anterior ilium side. So let's take a look. If you see someone standing and they tend to have a toe out position, typically they may have an anterior rotation. What does Eddie have? See how he's externally rotated more on this side? That could be because his piriformis is tight or lateral rotators are tight. That could be because he abducts his forefoot or he has a tibial torsion or femoral torsion. Of course, you could sit and go crazy looking at all of those with the appropriate orthopedic tests. But just a quickie. If you see that lateral rotation, that implies that that light leg might be functioning as if it's longer. You would, of course, take a tape measure and measure the true and apparent leg length differences by measuring from the umbilicus to the distal medial malleoli on both sides and comparing them, and then from the ASIS to the distal medial malleoli on both sides. The long leg may have an anterior rotation. With an anterior rotation, the acetabulum moves inferiorly, so the whole leg moves down with it. Your leg moves down away from your body, looks longer. Okay, if they have a true leg length difference, well, is there anything you can do about that? Shoe lift, but you're not going to be able to correct the pelvis. Let's see if there's a muscle energy technique that we can use to correct the pelvic rotation. If someone has, you may want to make a note of this in your book. If someone has an anterior rotation, say, on the right, the anterior side leg is going to look longer when he's lying down. The anterior side leg is going to appear to be shorter when he's supine. So you will measure with a tape measure. We can just eyeball for the sake of the class here. I wonder if one leg is longer than the other. We'll give him just a little pull to make sure he's straight on the table. Dominant eye right in the spot between his malleoli. And actually, he's even. But with an anterior rotation, the right would appear longer. In the long sitting position, again, straighten out his legs, make sure his knees are both flat against the table. If the right leg became shorter now, so now equal to the left or even shorter, that would be an anterior rotation of the ilium. The leg's longer in lying, shorter in short sitting, long sitting. Okay, so go back down. There's other tests that you would do with this, but just to illustrate briefly how we could use some muscle energy, we'll say he has an anterior rotation on the right. In standing, he would have a low right ASIS and a high left ASIS. He would have a high right PSIS and a low left PSIS. What muscle could we use to fix that tight anterior rotation on the right? His hip flexors are tight. What could we contract to reverse it? Hip extensors. So have his hip and knee at 90 degrees. He could even do this as a home program. I could resist him here. Feel my hands under your thigh. Push your thigh down into my hands. And I have him contract pretty strong. Give me a good 75% of how hard you could push. You need some good force to correct that ilium. He could do it himself. Put your hands under here. Lace them together. Hold your leg at a right angle. Let your hip and your knee push down. Give it a good push. Count to 10. 1, 1,000. 2, 1,000. 3, 1,000. 10 second hold. 5 reps. And he will go ahead and do this in a home program. I'll have patients do twice a day. In the morning before you leave the house, in the evening when you're home, go ahead and try this technique, pushing down on the right, and he'll have it in writing with pictures so he knows exactly what to do. Five reps, hold for 10 seconds on the right, then we'll switch off. We're going to do something different on the left side. Ready? Let go. What muscles can he use to create an anterior rotation on the left, the side that is abnormally posterior? hip flexors. So bend this up just like the other, but this time your hands go on top. Put two hands on top, pull your knee up into your hands, give it a good pull, hold it, don't let it move, good pull, one 1,000, two 1,000, up to 10, 10 second hold, isometric. This will anteriorly rotate that left posterior ilium. If the muscle energy 
is enough to get him back into the neutral position, or at least moving in that direction. I will have him do this exercise until he maintains the correction, which means over at least two visits, I see he holds his pelvis in a straight and symmetrical position. If he doesn't, then I need to do some other work. Maybe need to do more stretch of the hamstrings on the left side, more stretch, maybe some muscle energy stretch to the hip flexors on the right, maybe some soft tissue, some myofascial work, and relax. You could bend here. One last thing is an adductor isometric, and that's to get both adductors to work pulling on the pubic bone at the same time. If you have simultaneous firm contraction of the adductors, very frequently a rotated ilium will snap right back into place, often with a loud noise. So I'll put my arm between his legs or basketball or something, make a space. Feel my hand between here, squeeze your knees together. Give me a big squeeze. Sometimes you'll have that audible pop and relax. Adductor isometrics can also be part of the home program. Put a basketball between your knees, give it a big squeeze for 10 seconds, five reps, let it go. And I'll check you again. Here's the key. Should the patient do this exercise forever? No, it's going to create a problem the other way, right? So he only does this exercise until he maintains the correction. If the correction doesn't occur, he might need a mobilization. He might need manipulation. He may need some other interventions. But this is something, if you see a change in clinic, there's a good indication that doing the muscle energy at home could be very helpful for him. I actually give the patient pictures with this. Very easy to get pictures right off your computer. Take pictures in your office, hand them out to the patients. They need to know what to do. I find if I verbally just tell them, they go home, they get all mixed up. Was it up on the right or the left or both? They don't know what to do. OK, so to summarize, muscle energy can be used to increase range of motion and or strength. We want to be gentle when we're working, always work within the tolerance of the patient. Start with getting the range of motion back first. This way we have some range to work with for strengthening later. Position them in the restricted range. Put the tight muscle on stretch. Contract the tight muscle gently, 20 to 50% of their maximum voluntary contraction. You don't need them to go really hard. Resist the tight muscle isometrically. Once it relaxes, it allows you to stretch. Get that post-isometric relaxation response. Don't have them fighting you. Stretch them two to three reps, up to five reps. See when you start to get some increased motion. You should see measurable increase in each visit. Okay, then you're going to follow with strengthening. Isometrics initially through varying angles of the range of motion. Gradually working into isotonics resisted in the range of the motion where they're stronger. You might have to assist them in that new end range you just achieved because they're a little weak. Okay, does this make sense? You're just following, you're sequencing. Follow by teaching the patient home exercise programs. Make sure you remember to teach them those functional activities, ergonomics, proper lifting, proper posture. If they're involved in sports, you might want to refer them to an expert coach so that they could go ahead and fine tune their running style or their style of dancing technical development classes. So that's a good point, you have referral. If you find that someone is holding emotional tension and that's contributing to what's happening, relaxation exercise, surface EMG biofeedback, counseling for stress reduction, counseling to manage some of that tension, very, very helpful.